Hi and welcome to this important Keystone project. In this project you will have the opportunity to apply what you have learned so far. So loading stock data from free web sources like Yahoo Finance and uh, preparing data for a very fast analysis. And I highly recommend uh, doing uh, the project on your own as much as possible. But of course uh, I do provide uh, the solution as well. So let's start and let's have a look at uh, the assignment. So the project is all about uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index or short Dow Jones. And uh, this is probably the most popular and well-known stock index in the world. And it contains uh, 30 large and prominent companies listed in uh, the US. And uh, later in the course, uh, we will go a lot deeper into stock indexes. But for now, it's sufficient to know and understand that uh, the Dow Jones index uh, kind of summarizes or aggregates the performance of uh, large US stocks. And it's a quite okay representation of uh, the overall US stock market. But of course, uh, there are more appropriate ones. So the Dow Jones index has uh, 30 constituents. And uh, now here, we shall actually load historical price and volume data for all 30 stocks or constituents. And then we also shall load and save other stock information like the exchange, the industry, maybe some price performance or also dividend performance. So the dividend yield or the price to book ratio and also the forward price earnings ratio. And uh, then once we have that information, then we should also compare or sort uh, the stocks uh, by, for example, the price performance or the dividend yield or the ratios here. Now the most important question is uh, what are the 30 constituents of uh, the Dow Jones index and unfortunately we can't uh, search for ticker symbols or pull index uh, constituents from Yahoo Finance and that's uh, why we have to rely on other free sources like for example Wikipedia and uh, let's click here on the link. So this is uh, the article about or on the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index and uh, here we can see the list uh, with uh, the components. So here are the uh, 30 components as of August 2020. And now the good news is uh, that Pandas uh, allows us to load tables from a website with uh, pd.reach.html and uh, we have to pass here the URL and uh, then Pandas loads all tables that you can find on a website. And then you have to select uh, the first, uh, the second or the third tables or whatever. And then you have a nice data frame. So that's a hint here. And now if you like, you can try it on your own. And otherwise uh, you will see here the uh, solution below. So have fun. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in uh, the solution videos. Bye. In this video we are going to load uh, the 30 constituents from the web. So from uh, Wikipedia and uh, we need uh, Y Finance and uh, also Pandas for this and uh, the next lectures. And actually then we need uh, the URL of uh, the article here on Wikipedia. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average article. And then we can try to pull here the table with uh, the 30 constituents. So the URL is uh, this here and uh, then we can pass uh, the URL to pandas.readhtml uh, and uh, by doing so pandas uh, loads all tables here in a website and uh, it actually organizes all tables in a list. So there are a couple of tables and you can see here the list starting here and then we have a couple of tables and uh, we can simply select uh, single tables uh, from a list. So we can simply use here the indexer and for example, select uh, the very first table, which is uh, this one here. So now let's continue with uh, the second table. And uh, this is uh, the table that we actually want. So we list uh, with all 30 constituents. So from uh, 3M until Walmart. And then we have a couple of uh, columns here in the data frame. So the company name, the exchange like New York Stock Exchange, 
then the ticker symbol, the industry, then the date uh, when uh, the company or the stock was added to the Dow Jones index and some minor notes and finally also the index weighting. So the weight of uh, the stocks in the Dow Jones index. And as always, uh, we should get some more information and uh, meta information about the data frame with uh, the info method. And uh, we can see here that uh, we have the data type object, but here for the column uh, date added, uh, we should have a date time. And for index weighting, we should have uh, float. And also we can see some white spaces here in column headers. So like in date added or in index weighting. So there's definitely some need uh, for data cleaning and preparation. And that's uh, the plan now for the next minutes. So first of all, it definitely makes sense to rename, for example, uh, the column headers date added to date added. So with an under slash and from index weighting just to weights. And then we have to turn the data type and date added to daytime with pandas to daytime. And then we have to replace uh, the percentage uh, sign from uh, the weights column. And actually we not only replace uh, the percentage sign, we also convert uh, the data type to numeric. So in this case, it should be float. And let's check again here, DF. So now we have changed uh, the two column headers. And uh, now if we rerun here, the info method, we can see that uh, we have date time 64 in the date added column. And uh, we have numerical data in the weights column. And now we can make a cross check. So the weights uh, should sum up to 100%. And uh, these are some minor rounding issues here. So some rounding here in the numbers. Next, we can drop columns uh, that uh, we don't need. So for example, the notes column. And uh, we can set uh, the ticker symbol as uh, the index. So now here we have uh, the index symbol. And finally, for the next lecture, so we can save uh, the ticker symbols in a list. So in the list symbols. And then last but not least, it's important to understand uh, that from time to time, index uh, constituents are getting replaced by other constituents. And uh, this is also referred to index uh, reconstitution. And uh, now let's check uh, for the latest uh, reconstitution. So the date of the latest reconstitution. So we go inside uh, the date added uh, column and uh, check uh, the latest date with uh, the max method. So the last update was at uh, the end of August uh, 2020. And let's check here. So I think that a couple of uh, stocks were added here. So for example, Honeywell. And uh, we will continue here in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now let's load historical price and volume data for all 30 stocks from Yahoo Finance. And uh, we still have saved uh, the list symbols with all 30 ticker symbols. And now the question is uh, which time period uh, should we select? And it's actually reasonable to load historical data since uh, the last index uh, reconstitution. So the last uh, update was at uh, the end of August uh, 2020. So now we have uh, the ticker symbols and also the a starting date here. And uh, with this, we can actually run uh, the download. So we pass symbols uh, to tickers and uh, last update to start. And uh, we save the data frame in TS. So for time series, uh, this is time series data. And here we can see, we have successfully downloaded uh, 30 of uh, 30 stocks. And uh, again, uh, we have here a multi-index in the columns. And uh, we can also check here the info method. And in total, we have 558 uh, trading days from end of August 2020 until, in my case, uh, the 15th of November 2022. And uh, we have 180 columns, so 6 uh, times uh, 30. 
And then as a short repetition, for example, we can select the close prices only. And here we can see that for some stocks in the recent data, we have some missing values. And therefore it might make sense to drop rows uh, with uh, missing values with a drop in A. Now in the next step, uh, we can calculate a simple metric for the price performance. So what uh, we could actually do, we could calculate uh, the total price increase. So from the first day until the last one in percent. So the total price increase since uh, the last index uh, reconstitution. And uh, what we have to do here, so we have to divide the last price by the first price. And then to get uh, the price increase or decrease in percent, uh, we have to subtract one. And uh, for example, we could uh, sort uh, the values in a descending order. So let's do this and let's save uh, the resulting Panda series in performance perf. And uh, here we have for the high performing stocks. So the first one increased by 122% and uh, the second one by 86%. But also here below we have some low performers so that experienced a price drop so a negative uh, price increase and for example so here we have minus 41 percent and actually it's best to load here the performance into our original data frame uh, with the companies as well so i do think that most of you are not familiar with all ticker symbols here and as a first step so we have to rename here the index symbol and then we have here a panda series uh, with a symbol and uh, still we have df with uh, the index symbol and uh, this makes it pretty simple and straightforward to actually copy here the panda series into the data frame df so we can simply create a new column performance and pass here uh, the panda series performance and by doing so, we add here another column performance. And finally, one more time, we can sort uh, the stocks by the performance. So from high to low. And uh, so the best performer is here Chevron. And here below we have Salesforce. So we have a loss of uh, 41%. So a price decrease of 41% since the end of August 2020 and uh, we will continue here in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In this lecture we are going to load more detailed stock data for all 30 stocks from Yahoo Finance with uh, the Y Finance ticker object and uh, this is also called cross-sectional data because it contains uh, the latest stock properties for 30 stocks as of today but not over time. So whenever we have data over time, like historical prices, then uh, this is called time series data. But uh, with uh, the ticker object, we can get cross-sectional data. And as a recap, so we can create uh, the ticker object, for example, from Microsoft. And then we can get a lot of information with uh, get info. So this is here a dictionary. And uh, we can also convert uh, to a data frame, to a transpose data frame, where we have um, all properties here as column header. And each and every row is here one stock or one company. So here in the first row, we have my Microsoft. And uh, the plan is now to actually uh, load and uh, create a data frame with all 30 stocks, where we have 30 rows and uh, 154 columns and uh, we still have saved all ticker symbols and then first of all let's create an empty data frame with the pandas data frame and uh, we save it uh, for example in cs so uh, cross-sectional data and uh, then we can create uh, the data frame with a pretty simple for loop so we iterate over the symbols and then uh, we need to use here try and accept. So if uh, one symbol actually returns an error, then we should catch uh, the error with a try and accept. And by doing so, we avoid that uh, the program stops after an error. So whenever a ticker symbol is not found, uh, Python uh, simply prints the ticker symbol not found 
but it continues uh, with uh, the next one. And uh, to monitor the download process, we actually count here the symbols and uh, print uh, the running number. So let's simply see this live in action. And uh, for each and every symbol, we actually pull here the info. And info is actually a data frame uh, with uh, one row. And then we concatenate uh, CS and info to actually add uh, the symbol here to the data frame. And uh, let's see this live in action. So let's create here the cross-sectional data frame. And here we can see the running number. And in total, we should have 30. And obviously we have successfully downloaded uh, more detailed information for all 30 stocks. So the download is complete and uh, we don't uh, have here the statement uh, ticker symbol not found. And now let's check here the data frame CS with uh, 30 rows and 155 columns. And obviously the index is here meaningless, so we have zeros and it definitely makes sense uh, to actually use uh, the symbol as uh, the index. And then we rename to symbol with a capital S. And now we have here the data frame. So each row is one stock and we have 154 columns and properties. And finally, let's check here with the info method. And uh, we will continue and further inspect here the data frame CS in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. We still have safe DF and uh, CS uh, with tons of metrics and raw data for the uh, 30 constituents. And actually we could spend hours on analyzing all 150 columns, 54 columns, but uh, that's not uh, the major focus here in this section. Instead, uh, it's loading, cleaning and preparing data for analysis. And uh, just to have a few more examples, Let's have a closer look at uh, the price to book ratio one more time, the dividend yield and uh, the forward price uh, to earnings ratio. And actually we can directly get uh, the price to book ratio here from the data frame CS. So under price to book and we can already sort uh, the values in a descending order starting with uh, the highest. And actually here we have Home Depot with a very high price to book ratio of uh, over 1000. And uh, the reason for it uh, could be that uh, the book value of equity is close to zero. So if uh, the denominator of uh, the price to book ratio, so the book value is close to zero, then the ratio can take very high values. And then it's no surprise uh, that Apple is one of those stocks uh, with a pretty high price to book value. But again, this doesn't mean that uh, Apple is uh, overvalued or overpriced. And now if you go down, uh, the price to book ratio gets closer to one. And uh, here we have Boeing and McDonald's uh, where we have uh, the value none. And uh, we should further analyze this. So we could directly access here the book value of Boeing. And uh, the problem is here, so that's uh, the book value per share. And uh, the problem is here that uh, we have a negative value. And also for McDonald's, we have uh, a negative uh, book value of equity. And uh, we can conclude here that uh, negative or close to zero book values actually distort uh, the price to book ratio. So in this case, uh, the price to book ratio is getting less meaningful. And now to get a value even for Boeing or McDonald's, we could uh, calculate uh, the price to book ratio manually. So even if we get negative values for these two stocks and uh, we create here the additional column price to book for DF and we simply divide uh, the current price. So price per share by the book value per share. And then we have here another column. So the price to book column now let's move on with uh, the dividend yield. So let's recap that a stock's uh, total return consists of uh, the price return and uh, the dividend yield. 
and uh, the divi dividend yield is simply the dividend per share divided by the price or to put it uh, the other way so the total dividend payment divided by the market capitalization and uh, we can directly access uh, the dividend yield here and also here we can see that uh, we have uh, the value none and uh, whenever the last uh, dividend uh, payment was uh, zero we have here none and it uh, makes sense here to fill none or missing values uh, with uh, zero and then we add here another column so dividend yield to df here on the right and finally we have uh, the forward price to earnings ratio which is actually uh, the price per share divided uh, by the forecasted uh, earnings so for the next year and actually we can access uh, the forward price earnings ratio here in the CS data frame and uh, we create the column forward price earnings ratio here on the right and now let's make a simple analysis and comparison and let's sort uh, the stocks for example by the price to book uh, ratio from high to low and once again we have here home depot with uh, over 1000 but i think it's uh, due to the book value close to zero and here we have the high price to book, book value stocks and here the low ones and here we have uh, negative values next let's do the same also for the forward price to earnings ratio so here on the right we have uh, the forward price to earnings ratio and uh, the highest value is here for Boeing and I suspect that uh, the reason for the high forward price to earnings ratio for Boeing is simply because uh, the earning forecasts are pretty low so the denominator here is pretty low and therefore we have a quite high value here and then followed here by Salesforce, Nike, McDonald's and so on and then we have here the stocks uh, with a low price to earnings ratio so for example Verizon or Goldman Sachs and finally let's identify high dividend paying stocks and uh, low dividend paying stocks so here we have uh, the dividend yield and uh, for Verizon we have here almost 7% dividend yield that's uh, pretty high followed by Dow and uh, Intel and here Below we have uh, no dividends or very low. So for example, also Apple is a low dividend paying stock. So this was just uh, scratching the surface uh, with uh, three examples, but of course you can do a lot more here. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lectures. Bye. All right, we have learned that the major challenge is not getting the data for a specific ticker symbol, the major challenge is to get uh, complete lists uh, with ticker symbols for stock markets, indices and exchanges. And I've listed here a few examples how you can retrieve such lists. And uh, most powerful for the US market is uh, the NASDAQ uh, stock screener. So let's have a look here. And uh, here we can find uh, all listings on uh, US stock exchanges. And uh, you can actually filter here the stocks so by the rating or by the market cap or whatever and uh, then once uh, you have your list you can actually download uh, the corresponding csv file and then you can load uh, the csv file into pandas so that's uh, pretty simple so for us listings uh, the nasdaq uh, stock screener is uh, the best tool actually so the best free tool and uh, then for example we can get all 500 constituents of uh, the s p 500 on wikipedia and here we can use uh, read html so similar to the dow jones index constituents and likewise we can also get uh, the german dax 40 stocks in this table here and uh, the euro stocks 50 the FTSE 100 and last but not least we can also get uh, the listings uh, for worldwide exchanges on interactive brokers so this is uh, really powerful here so here we can get uh, the exchange listings for North America Europe Asia Pacific and uh, other parts of the world 
And for example, we could select here the New York Stock Exchange. And then we can select uh, whether we want to display here ETFs, indices, stocks or warrants. And if we select here, for example, stocks, then we get uh, the listings on the New York Stock Exchange. So the ticker symbol and the name and also the currency. And actually here we have a couple of pages and in the next lecture I will demonstrate with an example how you can load all pages uh, of an exchange with a simple Python code. So thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, as I said before, real stock trading is an essential part of this course and uh, so not only theory and coding and uh, there do exist a couple of good online brokers for stock trading and I selected here interactive brokers uh, for a couple of reasons. And first of all it's important to mention here that uh, there are no inactivity fees anymore. So one year ago interactive brokers still charged monthly inactivity fees so charged if you don't trade but now there are no inactivity fees anymore so if you don't trade you don't pay anything. Second, Interactive Brokers is one of the leading and most popular and well-known brokers and it's actually available in almost all countries all over the world. So it's uh, really hard to find a country where Interactive Brokers is prohibited and uh, you can check here the available countries list. So have a look if uh, your country is included here. So it's uh, very likely. So I'm here on interactivebrokers.com and uh, this is in particular for US traders, but it's best to go to the respective uh, regional site, so in your region, because services and terms can differ from region to region and uh, you can scroll here down and then you can find information on other interactive brokers affiliates. So for example here for Canada, for UK, for Europe and more. So once again Interactive Brokers is available in most countries and uh, the third advantage is that it offers a wide range of products and services and instruments to be traded. So we can check here under trading the uh, products and uh, you can actually trade stocks, ETFs, options, futures then currencies, uh, cryptos, uh, gold, bonds, funds, some mutual funds and hedge funds and more. Coming to the fourth advantage, so Interactive Brokers allows API trading uh, via Python. So that's uh, the ultimate goal of this course here. So not uh, manually trading, but letting Python uh, making trades and uh, investments here. And finally, trading costs like uh, commissions and spreads are rather low. And in particular for US traders, the commissions for US stocks and US ETFs are zero when selecting the Lite account. So you can check this here. So US traders uh, can either select uh, the Lite account and uh, here this is in particular for retail clients and uh, this offers zero commissions for US listed stocks and uh, ETF trades. But unfortunately the Lite account is only available for US traders but also for all other traders. So commissions and uh, spreads are competitive and uh, rather low. And uh, finally the information that you can find here on the website is uh, overwhelming for beginners. So we will not cover everything that you can find here on, on the website but uh, throughout the course I will add new topics step by step when appropriate. But I do recommend uh, going here to the education section and in particular here to the Traders Academy. And there you will find a lot of lessons and learning videos covering various topics. And once again uh, we will cover some of them but of course not all. So feel free to check here the education section and uh, watch here some videos. And uh, we will continue in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now Interactive Brokers offers two different accounts. 
a paper trading account and a live account. And as uh, the name says, uh, the live account allows you to trade uh, with uh, real money, while the paper trading account is a trial or a demo account where you can test and learn with paper money, so no real money, and therefore there's uh, zero risk of losses. And uh, as uh, the paper trading account offers pretty much all features and functions of a live trading account, we will start here with uh, the paper trading account. And actually creating a paper trading account is uh, really simple and straightforward, so it won't take more than five minutes. While creating a live account takes longer, so probably a couple of days, as you have to go through the application and identification process. So I'm still here on Interactive Brokers and then you can click on the free trial. And uh, as I said, so the free trial includes uh, most of uh, the features. So you have access to all platforms and uh, you can get market data for probably all products. But typically the data is delayed by 10 to 15 minutes. And then once uh, you have gained enough experience and uh, practice, then you can simply convert the free trial into a live account. And actually in case uh, you already have a live account here on Interactive Brokers, then you automatically also have a paper trading account so you will see this uh, when uh, logging in into the live account. And now let's simply click here on start your free trial. And once again, creating a free trial account is uh, pretty simple and straightforward. So you only need uh, your email address and a username and a password. And then you also have to select uh, your country and uh, with this you can create uh, your free trial account and uh, in your account you will find uh, 1 million US dollar. So th of course uh, this is just uh, virtual or paper money and uh, you can play around uh, with it so there's no risk of uh, losing real money. And uh, once you have created uh, the paper trading account you can click here on login, portal login and then you have to fill in here your username and uh, your password and uh, then you can select between the live account and the, the paper trading account. So if you have both you can select it here but otherwise so for now we should select uh, the paper trading account. And then it says here that uh, this is not a brokerage account so this is a paper trading account for simulated uh, trading and uh, currently I have here 976,000 cash sitting on my account and uh, you can also check your portfolio. So I have 976,000 cash and then I have 100 Apple stocks and uh, 100 Amazon stocks. And actually changing the settings of a paper trading account is uh, rather limited. So you can click here on account settings but uh, there are actually uh, no real options here. What uh, you can actually do is you can uh, reset your paper trading account. So you can reset it back to for example 1 million or any other amount. So for example 240,000 or whatever. And uh, we will continue here in the very next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. I am still here on my paper trading account and uh, this is actually uh, the client portal web app but uh, there do exist uh, different, uh, various different trading platforms and uh, the client portal is here one of them but uh, if we check here why interactive brokers then we can see that uh, there are various platforms here. So depending on uh, your experience and uh, the client portal is one of them. So it's an easy to use web application for beginners and also intermediate traders. And in my experience, uh, the client portal for the paper trading account, so at least for the paper trading account is a bit buggy. So if I go here back, then let's recall that uh, in the last video, we have seen that uh, I should have uh, more than 900,000 cash here but I can't see it now in this uh, session. 
and I also can't check here my portfolio with uh, Apple and Microsoft and therefore we should use another platform and it's actually the Trader Workstation, so TWS, so that's uh, the flagship uh, desktop uh, platform. And as you can see, it's more for the intermediate and uh, more advanced uh, traders. And uh, there's also a second and even more important reason why we should work here with uh, the Trader Workstation. So the Trader Workstation is a bit more reliable, at least for the paper trading account. And also it provides some more functionalities and options, but uh, the downturn is here that it's a bit more complex and it can be a bit overwhelming for beginners. So we will see this. And last but not least, and uh, that's uh, the most important reason. So for API trading with Python, we need to download and install uh, the Trader Workstation anyway. And uh, that's uh, the plan here for this video. So if you go down here, then you can't find here below software downloads. And uh, let's click here on the Trader Workstation. And here's uh, the online version and the offline version. And I do recommend the online version. And either you select here the most current stable production version or the uh, time-tested version. So it doesn't really matter. So one of uh, these two here. And actually, if you click here on one of these two, then you will download an installer. And I have the installer here on my desktop. And then you can simply double click on the installer. And then after having successfully installed uh, the uh, Trader Workstation, then you should have the icon on your desktop. So now I do have uh, the Trader Workstation here the icon on my desktop and uh, then with a double click uh, you can actually start uh, the trader workstation and uh, that's uh, the plan for the next lecture thanks for watching and see you there bye now let's open here the trader workstation with a double click and then you have to insert here your username and your password and you can either select uh, the live trading account or the paper trading account so let's move on. So let's copy paste here the username and the password and let's click on paper login. So this is here the Trader Workstation. And uh, as I said before, so beginners can be a bit overwhelmed here. And I won't go through everything here. So I will only explain uh, what uh, we really need step by step. And actually, once again, you can see here the message that uh, this is not a brokerage account. So this is a paper trading account for simulated trading. And uh, the market data that you actually see here is uh, delayed data, so by 15 minutes. And actually, what you see here is actually the mosaic uh, view and uh, there's also the classic view and also a learn section where you can find lessons and also videos like on the website. So let's go back. And I do prefer here the mosaic view and uh, there are various sections here. And the first and most important, you can see here the uh, current portfolio so currently I have on my account uh, close to 100,000 euro cash and close to 15,000 US dollar cash and uh, zero positions here in Apple and Amazon. So I recently sold my positions here and I reset my account. So now I've set uh, the cash here to 100,000 euro. And now currently I have close to 100,000 and uh, close to 15,000 uh, US dollar. And actually here on the right, you can see the net uh, liquidity. So that's uh, the sum here of uh, all values. So in simple words, but it's a bit more complicated. So this is uh, the portfolio. And then on the left hand side, you can select here uh, instruments for trading. So for example, here I have Lufthansa, or you could also select uh, Apple and uh, then you can buy and sell here Apple and here you can see bid and ask prices. 
So we will go through the details in the next lectures. And then here below, you can get some more information on the Apple stock. So the latest price, bid and ask prices and high and low prices and more. So earnings per share, price earnings, the market capitalization and also the price chart. And actually the setting is here one minute candles. So this is here a candlestick chart, but you can also change here the candle size. So for example, to hourly candles. And then below here you can find your most recent orders and your most uh, recent trades. And uh, finally here on uh, the lower right corner, you can see uh, some market news. So this is the Trader Working Station at a first glance. And in the next lecture, we will make a very first trade. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, I'm still here on the Trader Workstation. And now let's, uh, for example, buy 10 Microsoft stocks immediately at the best possible price. And buying uh, immediately at the best price means uh, we need to submit a market order. But first of all, let's select here and let's search here for Microsoft. So we can type here the ticker symbol MSFT. Uh, and then by pressing the enter key, we can get a selection of Microsoft related instruments. And uh, here we have first of all the stock, so the equity, and uh, that's actually the plan here. But uh, there are also other options. And for example, we can buy Microsoft options, warrants, structured products, uh, CFDs, and also bonds, for example. But now let's click here on the stock. And then we have to define the order type here. And essentially we have uh, the choice between a limit order and a market order. And whenever we want to buy immediately at the best price, then we have to submit a market order. So a market order is an order designed to fill quickly at the current uh, market bid or ask price. And uh, we will cover the limit order later on. But now let's select here the market order. And then we have to define the quantity and uh, we can define this here. So we said before that we want to buy 10 Microsoft shares. And here we can see the corresponding US dollar price. So around about 2,500 US dollar. So the current price is 250 times 10 is 2,500. And then here above we can see two different prices. So we have the bid price and the ask price and the mid price, which is between the bid and the ask price. And you can also see bid and ask price here. And uh, if you hover here over, then you can see a more detailed description. So the bid price is uh, the highest priced bid for the contract, or in other words, it's uh, the highest price that you can sell uh, the stock for. And uh, the ask price is uh, the lowest price that you can buy the stock for. And as you want to buy the Microsoft stock, then for us, uh, the ask price is uh, the prevailing price. And actually the ask price is always a bit higher than the bid price. So whenever you buy, you have to pay slightly more than if you sell the stock. And uh, the difference between the bid price and uh, the ask price is also called uh, the bid ask spread. And as you can see, prices change uh, uh, continuously. So a couple of times per second. And once again, so the ask price is uh, the important price if you want to buy. And finally, we can click here on buy and then we can submit the buy order over 10 stocks by clicking here. And then you can see the order overview. So the instrument, then uh, the prices and actually also the amount. So we want to buy 10 and the amount is 2,516. And also we can see here the commission that we have to pay so it's one dollar and we will cover commissions and trading costs in one of the next lectures. And then if we are ready to buy, we can click on transmit. And then here you can see now our new position. So it's 10 Microsoft stocks. And then we can see here the current market value. So 2,518, but 
uh, this can change here of course and uh, we can see here the price so the average price that uh, we had to pay and then in comparison the last price and here on the right uh, the change between uh, the price so that we paid for and the last price and currently we are minus here so we have now three positions here in our portfolio so 10 microsoft stocks and uh, still 10,000 euro and uh, the cash uh, balance was uh, reduced here by the purchase price and finally here below on the trades you can find uh, the order for microsoft so the quantity and the filled price and also the trade so the order was filled immediately at uh, this price here and here you can see the paid commission so one us dollar and then selling works in the very same way so we can select sell and uh, set the quantity to 10 again and uh, select a market order and alternatively we can also close uh, the position here with a right click and then we can go to trade and uh, then we can close uh, the position by 100 percent so we can sell the 10 stocks so here we have set uh, the trade automatically so 10 stocks for sale and then we can click on submit again and transmit and now we have zero microsoft here and and we have converted uh, the 10 microsoft shares into some more us dollar cash so these were our very first trades and uh, we will continue in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, we have to talk about trading hours and uh, most important, you should keep in mind that you cannot trade the stocks 24 hours a day and seven days a week. So you can't trade on weekends, Saturday and Sunday and you can't trade uh, on other bank holidays like a new year and uh, for all other trading days so typically from monday to friday there do exist uh, regular trading hours so for example for new york stock exchange listed stocks uh, the regular trading session is from 9 30 a.m to 4 p.m and that's uh, u.s eastern or new york time and actually regular trading hours may be a subset of uh, the instrument's total trading hours. So for some instruments and exchanges uh, there do exist uh, pre-trading periods. And uh, for example, so the total available hours on uh, the New York Stock Exchange is from 4 a.m. in the morning until 8 uh, p.m. However, I do recommend uh, that you trade only during the regular trading hours as liquidity is highest and the prices are most efficient during the uh, regular trading hours. So with the uh, lowest bid ask spreads. And actually depending on the instrument and the exchange, uh, the trading hours can differ. And uh, on uh, the uh, trader workstation, you can actually get the regular trading hours for your instrument or your exchange. So for example, let's go here to Apple and uh, right click and then you can get here the description under financial instrument info and then here you can see the trading schedule so for today it's uh, between 9 30 a.m and 4 p.m so that's uh, the local time so new york time and in my time zone so middle european time it's from 15 30 until uh, 22 o'clock in uh, the evening so and also here below you can see the total available hours but uh, once again you should stick here to the regular trading session and then you can get even more information by clicking here on calendar so here you can see for the next days uh, the trading uh, sessions and uh, the trading hours and it's no surprise uh, that here for saturday and sunday so the exchange is closed so you can't trade there so these are the trading hours for the apple stock and uh, as i said before so it depends on uh, the the exchange and the country so for example let's go now to a european or german stock lufthansa 
and also here we can get uh, the description and uh, here the exchange time zone is the middle european time and uh, the regular trading session is uh, from 9 a.m to uh, quarter to six o'clock in the evening and also the total available hours uh, deviate from the regular trading session but also here on weekends uh, the exchange is closed so the key message for you is uh, that uh, you should uh, keep in mind uh, the regular trading hours so you shouldn't try to trade on weekends or outside uh, the regular trading hours now finally you can change the settings uh, with regard uh, to uh, the uh, trading hours here in this uh, drop down menu and by default uh, the setting is day so the order will be active uh, during uh, the regular trading hours only so in case of Lufthansa it's between 9 and 17.45 and if you go here then you could actually enable fill outside the regular trading hours and then you are also able to uh, fill your orders in uh, the extended period but again I do not recommend this so you should stick here today and uh, with this uh, we have reached uh, the end of this lecture thanks for watching and see you in the next one bye we are coming now to an important topic on interactive brokers you have the choice between a cash account and a margin account and uh, to be more precise for the live account you have the choice between cash and margin account and you can change uh, that in your account settings and in uh, the paper trading account by default is a margin account and you can't change it uh, to a cash account. Now the important question is so what's uh, the difference between a cash account and a margin account and in a cash account as uh, the name says you can only buy stocks as long as your cash balance is sufficient so you can't buy more than you have and also you can only sell a stock at a quantity that uh, you actually own so if you own uh, 200 shares of apple then you can sell 200 shares but not more and if you uh, don't own any microsoft uh, shares then uh, you can't uh, sell microsoft and uh, in contrast to that a margin account allows you to buy stocks on margin and uh, that means uh, you can borrow money from the broker and buy stocks for a value higher than your actual cash account and also you can short sell stocks and uh, that means you can sell stocks uh, that uh, you actually don't own so you can borrow a stock from another trader and uh, short sell the stock and uh, the main motivation for short selling is uh, that it allows you to benefit from falling prices now the key message is uh, that short selling and margin trading is more risky and it's actually limited to more experienced traders and uh, depending on your country the margin account is either prohibited or you need to deposit and maintain a minimum cash amount so typically 2000 US dollar or more and uh, in uh, this section uh, I won't go through the details of margin trading or short selling so there are many more things uh, that uh, you have to keep in mind like uh, margin rates the cost of borrowing and more and uh, you can find a lot of information on margin trading so for example here so what's margin trading and so on and you can also find uh, the prices for margin trading so the borrowing rates or the margin rates and also on the trader working station you will find a couple of uh, items related to margin trading so here on the right you have uh, information on uh, your margin so net liquidity excess liquidity and if you click here on account then you can see some more definitions so for example we have for the net uh, liquidation value and when you hover here over the items uh, you can get a definition and uh, most important here is uh, your current uh, cash balance and obviously my cash balance is here 100,000 euro but uh, the buying power is much higher so 665,000 euro and uh, this is related to margin uh, trading so I could uh, buy stocks on margin here in uh, my paper trading account 
So feel free to check here the definitions and uh, to go into the education section or learn section and uh, here you will find uh, further information and also videos on margin trading and uh, short selling and uh, we might cover some of uh, those topics later in the course when it's more appropriate but for now let's assume that uh, we work with an ordinary cash account thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture bye now let me show you another great feature here on interactive brokers so fractional trading and here under stocks etfs you can see fractional trading and the fractional trading means that you can buy fractions of a share regardless of uh, the share price so for example if uh, a share price is 900 us dollar then without the fractional trading you can buy one share for 100 or two shares for 1800 which is uh, really inflexible but uh, fractional trading allows you to invest the 100 dollars 500 or 1000 dollar or whatsoever in uh, that stock and uh, to invest for example 100 dollar in the microsoft stock you have to do uh, the following so once again we have selected microsoft and still it's a market order and then we have to go here inside quantity and uh, we can either set uh, the quantity in terms of shares or the quantity in terms of us dollar and then we can set here the quantity for example to 500 and then we can see that uh, this is around one share and if you have a look at the current price so it should be almost uh, two shares And now if we click here on submit and uh, transmit then we can see that uh, we have only acquired uh, one share for 253 and uh, the reason is uh, that in your account you have to enable fractional trading which can't be done here in the paper trading account but uh, the live account uh, will have that option. Now I'm here on my live account and you can change uh, the settings here and uh, then you can go to trading permissions and uh, here you can enable fractional trading but again this is only possible for the live account and not uh, for the paper trading account. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. All right, we need to talk about trading costs and uh, those who have attended any of my other trading courses know it's all about trading costs and uh, therefore trading costs is one of the most important topics in trading and investing because active trading and investing strategies trigger many trades and even if uh, strategies uh, seem to be profitable before trading costs, many of them are unprofitable if we take into account trading costs. Now there do exist uh, visible trading costs like uh, trading commissions and uh, hidden trading costs like uh, the bid ask spread and uh, we have to take into account both so visible costs and uh, hidden costs and therefore zero trading commissions uh, doesn't mean anything. So typically you have to pay zero trading commissions uh, with higher or wider bid ask spreads and uh, typically hidden costs are higher than visible costs. So we definitely need to analyze trading costs in more detail. And now let's start with uh, the trading commissions here on interactive brokers and we can go to pricing and uh, to commissions. And then we select here stocks and ETFs. So depending on uh, the asset class or the instrument costs are different. And uh, this course is all about stocks and ETFs. Next, depending on whether we trade US exchange listed stocks or European stocks or Asian stocks, then commissions uh, differ so significantly. And now let's focus here on US listed stocks, United States here. And typically commissions for US exchange listed stocks are the lowest compared to European or Asian stocks. And once again, with a light account, uh, you pay zero commissions for US stocks, but uh, this is only eligible for US residents only. 
And even if you are a US resident, so it does not necessarily mean that this is uh, the best choice for you. So you should read also here the terms and conditions. And for all other traders outside uh, the US, you have the choice between fixed fees and uh, tiered fees. And while tiered fees uh, seem to be lower, they are not necessarily lower as uh, some third party fees are not included here and uh, they need to be paid separately. And actually in your account setting, you can change uh, the fee structure from tiered to fixed and uh, the default setting is here fixed. So for retail investors, it's uh, fixed. And now let's analyze uh, the fixed uh, trading commissions with an example. And uh, therefore I've created a little integrated Excel model to actually simulate trading costs. So once again, here we have um, the uh, fees for US exchange listed stocks. And here we have uh, the fixed fees. And actually the general rule is so that you have to pay 0 0.005 US dollar per share. So irrespective of the trading volume here. So the commission per share is 0 0.005 US dollar. Then next, uh, the minimum commission per order is one US dollar. So even if you only buy one share, so in this case, you have to pay one dollar and not a 0 0.005 dollar. So that's uh, the minimum commission per order. And then there's also a maximum commission per order. And uh, this is 1% of uh, the trade value. And then we have additional fees uh, for selling transactions. So let's check again here the third uh, party fees. So we have here the regulatory fees and we can check them here. So we have uh, for sell transactions, we have uh, the SEC transaction fee and uh, the FINRA trading activity fee. So we shouldn't forget this year, but only for sell transaction and not for buy transactions. So these are the terms and conditions for uh, the fixed uh, fee structure. And now let's have a look at an example. And I've created a little screenshot from Microsoft. And uh, here we have uh, the following ask price. So 252.48 and uh, the bid price 252.44. And therefore the mid price is here at 4.6. So we can see here the mid price and then the ask price and uh, the bid price and uh, the mid price is exactly in the middle between the bid price and uh, the ask price. And actually here below you can once again see the bid and the ask price and uh, the size. And uh, 200 times 200 here means that uh, currently, so at uh, the time here, you could uh, buy 200, so maximum 200 shares for the cheapest price of 252.48. And uh, you can sell maximum 200 shares for the best selling price of 252.44. And actually this is uh, the so-called top part of uh, the order book. So uh, the most favorable prices for you and uh, the corresponding sizes. And in case you want to buy more than 200 or sell more than 200, then you get a less favorable price because then you slip uh, actually in the order book. But for now, let's assume that uh, the maximum order size here for us is 200, so 200 shares. And then we can actually differentiate between the buy transaction and uh, the sell transaction. And uh, first of all, we can calculate uh, the trade value, which is for the buy transaction, simply the number of shares times uh, the ask price. And for the sell transaction, the number of shares times uh, the bid price. And then we can calculate trading commissions uh, with uh, the following rules here. So we have 0 0.005 per share, but uh, the minimum is $1 and the maximum is 1% of uh, the trade value. And here's uh, the little formula. And uh, this leads uh, to a commission of $1 for the buy transaction. And then if we consider the sell transaction, so we have to add here 
the SAC fee and the FINRA fee. And uh, then this leads to 2.18. So a total commission of 2.18 for the sale transaction. So we can see here that uh, the sale is more ex expensive than the buy transaction in terms of commissions. So these are the absolute numbers, but uh, for us, it's even more important to have uh, the proportional trading costs, which is nothing else than uh, the absolute numbers divided by the trade value. So for the buy transaction, it's only 0.002% and it's uh, twice as much for the sell transaction. And if we stop here, we could conclude uh, that the trading costs are really low. So the proportional trading costs but uh, so far we have only analyzed uh, the visible trading costs and also the proportional trading costs here depend on uh, the size of the order. So if we trade 200 shares uh, with a trade value of 50,000, then we have rather low proportional trading costs. But now, for example, if we reduce to only 10 shares, then still for the buy transaction, we have one US dollar. So this is uh, the absolute uh, commission but in relative terms, uh, then here with a lower trade size, uh, the proportional trading costs are higher. So 0.04%. And then if we further reduce uh, the order size to one share, then the proportional trading costs increase even more. And for example here, 0.4% proportional trading costs is a significant uh, cost actually. So maybe uh, not if you just consider one trade, but if you consider 50 or 100 trades, then this is getting really expensive. But again, this is only here the uh, trading commission, so the visible cost. And in the next lecture, we will also analyze uh, the hidden trading costs. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, you can also download here this little Excel sheet and you can find the download attached to the previous lecture. So this allows you to play around, but uh, you should be careful here. So the model is only based here on US exchange listed stocks. So for other countries, you actually have to change the formulas. So if you check here Euro, for example, then Austria has completely different rules and uh, these are not modeled here in uh, the Excel sheet, so only in the United States. Now in the last lecture we have analyzed the visible trading costs, so the trading commissions, and now let's focus on hidden costs. And uh, hidden costs and uh, visible costs uh, together form uh, the total trading costs. And uh, there's uh, the analogy of an iceberg where the visible part is uh, the smaller part and uh, the hidden part below the waterline is uh, the larger part of uh, the iceberg and uh, here also of uh, the total cost. And uh, you will see this in a couple of minutes. Now the bid ask spread that uh, we can observe here is uh, directly related to the hidden costs. So we have learned before that uh, we can buy stocks at uh, the ask price and uh, sell stocks at uh, the bid price and uh, the ask price is always higher than the bid price and uh, the difference is uh, the so-called bid ask spread. So here in this example the bid ask spread is uh, rather low. So we have uh, 0 0.04 uh, dollar difference that's pretty low. Now it's important to understand that the bid ask spread is nothing else than the profit for the broker or the market maker. So typically traders don't trade directly, but via an intermediary that sells the shares to buyers for a slightly higher price than he buys the shares from sellers. And uh, therefore the bid ask spread is uh, the profit for the broker. And therefore it should be viewed as the trading cost for the trader. And now let me illustrate this uh, with a little and uh, maybe extreme example. So let's assume that uh, we buy 200 Microsoft shares and then immediately sell 200 Microsoft shares at uh, the very same point in time. Then uh, we have uh, the following situation. So we buy at uh, the ask price and sell at uh, the bid price. And uh, then we have here the trading values. And after those two transactions, 
we are actually left uh, with a loss of in total eight dollar so that's simply the difference between the trade values here so we lose eight dollar and uh, this is uh, the total hidden cost for the full trade so buying and selling or selling and buying and then we can uh, narrow it down per trade so per trade it's still four dollar so eight divided by two and actually the eight dollar are also called spread cost and the $4 are typically called half spread cost. And uh, we can also calculate here the half spread cost uh, with uh, the following formula. So we can take uh, the bid ask spread divided by two times uh, the number of shares gives actually the half uh, spread cost $4. And then we can also calculate the proportional trading costs of the hidden costs. So it's simply the absolute cost divided by the mid price. So in this case, it's 0.0079%. And as you can see here, so the hidden cost $4 are higher than the visible costs so $1 or 2.18 for the sell transaction. And then with uh, this, uh, we can actually calculate total costs per trade. So on average in total, we have uh, the hidden costs of $4 plus uh, the weighted average of uh, buy and sell. So sometimes we buy and uh, sometimes we sell. And therefore the expected or uh, the average cost per trade is $5.59. And in relative or percentage terms, it's 0.01%. Now, 0.01% proportional trading costs is still very low, but uh, this is here, so to say, the optimal case that kind of minimizes trading costs. So we have a high trade value, and also we have a really low bid ask spread. So I think uh, this was at a time when uh, the trading volume and uh, the liquidity was high but if uh, there's uh, lower liquidity in the market then typically the spreads are higher and uh, for example if we reduce here the shares to maybe only 10 and uh, if we increase uh, the bid ask spread so it can be one dollar so why not then we have completely different uh, proportional trading costs. So now we have 0.24%, which is significantly higher than uh, the previous example. So there are various factors that influence uh, the proportional trading costs. So the trading size, uh, then the bid ask spread, and also the exchange where you trade. So uh, as I said, uh, so typically trading on US exchanges is uh, cheaper than uh, trading uh, uh, European or Asian stocks, but uh, this can differ. And uh, depending on your specific example, you should definitely analyze and calculate your proportional trading costs. And uh, throughout the course, uh, we will see some examples where uh, trading costs do matter and uh, where we should really uh, care about and uh, take into account trading costs. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye. All right, let's connect uh, to interactive brokers uh, via the API and uh, the wrapper package. And first of all, we need uh, to import everything from the wrapper package and uh, also so if uh, you are working on an interactive environment like Jupyter Notebook then you need also here the following line but uh, you have to actually comment or cross out this line if uh, you code in scripts so only in interactive environments you need uh, this here so let's run the cell here and then we can so to say create an interactive uh, brokers uh, object here so here's a more technical definition so with uh, ib and uh, we can save the object in ib and uh, then we can connect uh, with uh, the method connect but first of all you have to make sure that you are logged in in uh, your trader working station so i'm here logged in and uh, it only works if you have a connection to your trader working station so you need to be logged in and then you can simply connect with connect 
And uh, here you can see that I've successfully created a connection. And now with uh, the connection, uh, we can do a lot of things. So there are many possible calls and you can just check this here. So there are various methods and attributes. And uh, for example, you could check uh, your current positions. So currently I have one position in uh, my account. So that's uh, the account number. And then the position is a stock position. And here's uh, the contract ID. So it's uh, the Microsoft stock on the NASDAQ exchange. And uh, the currency is US dollar. And uh, the position is one, so one stock. And uh, the average price was 250.86. So let's make a double check here. So now here, this is my current position. So I have one Microsoft stock and then I have cash. And finally, at the end of the coding session, you should uh, disconnect uh, with disconnect. So this is how it works. And now let me demonstrate uh, probably the most uh, frequently made uh, mistake. So once again, you have to be locked in. And if uh, this is not the case, so I close here the connection. So if uh, you are not locked in, then it uh, won't work. And let me demonstrate this here. So here the connection failed and uh, you get uh, the following message. So API connection failed. And it says here, make sure that the API port on the uh, trader working station is open. So in other words, you need to be locked in in your trading working station. And uh, we will continue with uh, the API in the next lectures. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Again, let's import here the wrapper package and uh, let's uh, create a connection to interactive brokers. Now, whenever we want to do something uh, with an instrument like the Apple stock, so for example, uh, trading or creating orders or whatever, then we have to define and also find uh, the respective contract here on interactive brokers. And uh, this means uh, that knowing the ticker symbol is not sufficient. So we need to find uh, the contract. So that's an important aspect here when working with uh, the interactive uh, brokers API. And now let's start uh, with a simple example. So for example, uh, the currency pair Euro US dollar, and uh, we can create and find uh, a contract object with Forex and here we have to pass uh, the currency pair and uh, we also have here a default exchange. So we don't have to specify here the exchange. And if we run here, then uh, we have a Forex uh, contract object. And actually here we can see the currency pair and also the exchange. And uh, then the method the qualify contracts allows us to get some more information on the contract. So let's have a look inside. And uh, the method will fill in the missing fields in the contract. So for example, uh, the very important contract ID. So the contract ID is unique. So each and every uh, contract has a unique contract ID and knowing the contract ID is uh, pretty important. So let's get some more information on the contract. So here we have uh, the unique contract ID and some more information. And uh, this is actually a list uh, with uh, one contract here. And therefore one more time, we can get here the contract object so with uh, some more detailed information. And now we can access here the information in uh, the contract object. So for example, with uh, the attribute contract ID, we can get uh, the contract ID or with uh, the attribute exchange, we can get uh, the exchange and so on. So now here we have uh, the contract ID. So this was here the very first example. And uh, depending on uh, the asset class, so there are various ways how we can get a contract. So first of all, we can simply pass uh, the contract ID to contract. So this uh, works for all asset classes. But then again, so for Forex, we can use Forex or for stocks, 
we can use stock and then we can pass uh, the ticker symbol then uh, the exchange and typically we should use here smart for smart routing here on interactive brokers and then we can also define uh, the denominated uh, currency so for example us dollar so some stocks can be traded uh, with different currencies so for example us dollar and uh, euro or whatever and actually smart routing means uh, that interactive brokers searches different exchanges and uh, looks for the best execution price but uh, we can also further specify the primary exchange so for example nasdaq but uh, typically so this should be sufficient for stocks so smart routing where interactive brokers uh, automatically find the best and most favorable exchange and price then we have forex the cfds future instruments and also options and bonds and now let's have a look at an example here so we can create uh, the contract object uh, for a stock for example apple with uh, smart routing and uh, us dollar and uh, also here we can get some more information with qualify contracts and in this example uh, we have exactly one contract so for the settings apple smart routing and the us dollar However, if we only pass here the ticker symbol Apple and not uh, the exchange and also not uh, the currency, then uh, this uh, setting is ambiguous. So this means there are a couple of contracts uh, for the symbol Apple. And now if we run here, then uh, we get here the message ambiguous contract. So there do exist uh, several contracts and uh, we will go here further into the details in one of the next lectures but for the time being now let's uh, disconnect and uh, i see you in the next video thanks for watching and bye in the last lecture we have learned that in the interactive brokers api it's important to identify the right contract for your instrument and uh, having the right contract in place allows you to get for example current market data for the contract and actually market data is a pretty special and a bit more complex topic here on interactive brokers. So we have seen before that in our paper trading account that uh, the market data is delayed. So let's go here to uh, the trader working station. And here we can see that uh, this is not a brokerage account. Uh, this is a paper trading account and the market data is delayed. And uh, we can click here and uh, then we can see for example for us stocks so the delay is 15 minutes now the good news is that the live account gives you access to live data for many exchanges and for many instruments but not for all so for some market data you need a paid subscription and uh, you can find more information here when you go to pricing and market data market data fees and actually for example market data for currencies is included so the fees are waived here actually and also for uh, us equities and etfs so for streaming uh, non-consolidated data purposes so this is already included however there are a couple of different bundles and service levels here and uh, probably you won't uh, need them but in case you need uh, one of them then you know that uh, you can get it uh, with uh, the right uh, subscription here so let's go back to the jupyter notebook and let's get some uh, market data so let's create a connection and as i said before so for currencies we always get live data so no matter if uh, we have a paper trading account or a live account and uh, first of all we need to create a contract so for example for the currency pair euro us dollar and then we can actually request market data for a specific contract with ib dot request market data so we need to pass here the contract and then uh, we save uh, the market data object for example in data one and actually this takes a couple of seconds to actually fill here the data so now if you rerun data one then uh, we can get some more information 
So we have here the current the day time. So here we have year, then month, day, hour, and uh, minutes. And uh, then for example, we can see uh, the current bid price, uh, the current bid size, the ask price and uh, the ask size and the daily high, low, close. And it's important to understand here that in the background, uh, the connection is still there and it's getting updated. So if you rerun here data one, then we get updated data. So now we have here 46 minutes and 50 seconds. And if you rerun, we have 46 minutes and 57 seconds and so on. And also the data here, the prices are getting updated. And actually we can now go here into the data and uh, get some of the data. So for example, the current ask price so that's uh, the most uh, favorable price uh, to actually buy the instrument. And also here, if you rerun, then it's getting updated in real time. And also we can, for example, get uh, the ask size. So these are just two examples. And uh, then we can also get uh, the current market price, which is actually here, either the last uh, price if uh, within uh, the current bid ask, or if a no bid ask is available, then it's uh, the midpoint. And also this is getting updated in real time. And then for example, we can also get uh, the time. So this is a daytime object. And uh, we could also convert this into a pandas to daytime uh, object. So a pandas timestamp. And uh, we can see that uh, the localization is UTC time. So whenever we retrieve uh, daytime information from the API, then typically it's in UTC time. So you have to uh, take this into account. So this was Forex and now let's move on with uh, a stock, for example, Apple. And let's create here the market data object data two. And then we can also get here the data for data two. So for example, the current price, so the ask price or the ask size. And also here we can go inside to get uh, the current ask price that changes in real time. And uh, now let's move on with another example. For example, uh, the Lufthansa stock and uh, let's create data three. And uh, here we get an error and it says that uh, the requested market data is not subscribed. So we could get delayed uh, market data, but uh, this is not enabled, but uh, we can enable here delayed data with uh, the method uh, request market data type. And here we have the choice between live and uh, frozen delayed and delayed frozen. And uh, essentially, we should uh, select uh, delayed if we can't get live data. So typically delayed by 15 minutes. And uh, you can get more information on the market data types here by clicking on this link. But now let's change here the market data type to three. So typically by default it's set to a one live, but now let's set it to a three delayed. And now we should be able to get some delayed market data for Lufthansa. And uh, that's uh, the case here. And we can get uh, the market price, for example. But once again, this is delayed data. And uh, with this, we have reached uh, the end of this lecture. So let's disconnect and uh, see you again in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Now there's one more thing that I want to highlight here. So in the last lecture, we have created uh, three data requests in parallel for three different instruments. So for Euro US dollar, and uh, we have saved um, the data request in data one. And once again, so it's still running in the background and uh, we can update it. And same we can also do with uh, data two. So for the Apple stock, so it's uh, still running in the background and also the data request uh, for uh, data three. And this means uh, that we can actually request market data and uh, stream data for multiple tickers. 
and uh, just uh, for illustration purposes so we can uh, simply print the current market price for uh, three instruments here in a one second uh, frequency so in total 10 times we could uh, print the market price for the three instruments and uh, we actually sleep here one second and once again we have to use here ib.sleep and actually we can't use here time.sleep so we have to use ib.sleep and uh, we could sleep here one second between uh, the printouts so let's simply run the cell and here we have so to say data streaming for multiple tickers and uh, the prices are getting updated on a per second so every second and uh, this was just a little example here so printing out uh, the current market price uh, for three instruments but of course uh, we could also do other things uh, with uh, the prices for multiple tickers so we could uh, create technical indicators and uh, then verify whether there is a signal to buy or sell or whatever and uh, we might see more examples in the next uh, lecture sections and parts of this course thanks for watching and uh, see you there bye we have learned before that it is important to get the right contract for our instrument that we want to trade and uh, there is a more advanced way how we can find uh, the right contract but first of all let's import uh, the wrapper one more time and let's create here a connection and then uh, when searching for a contract uh, there are three possible outcomes so case one so our search is unambiguous so only one contract exists then second uh, the contract is unknown so that doesn't exist any contract uh, with uh, the details or third we have multiple contracts so the result or the search is uh, ambiguous here and now let's start here with the uh, case one so that's uh, the desired outcome and uh, if we pass here the apple symbol then smart and us dollar then uh, this is uh, clearly defined and only one contract exists and uh, we can check this and uh, even get more details on the contract with uh, the method uh, request contract details so we have to pass here the contract and uh, then we get uh, the contract details and uh, we save it here in cds contract details and uh, this is obviously a list and uh, we have here only one element so we can check this here with uh, the length function so we have uh, one contract and then we can get actually the contract and uh, then we can uh, select uh, the contract details here so for example the contract id or the symbol and we can further go here inside and get for example the contract id or we can get other information here so the contract uh, is uh, this here and then we can for example also get other information like market name or price magnifier or whatever so for example also the order types so this is uh, rather technical here so this was case one the simple case but now let's continue with uh, a symbol that is actually not defined so there doesn't exist a stock with uh, the following ticker symbol however if we create here the contract object then we don't uh, get an error here and uh, we only get an error if we pass here the contract to a request contract details and uh, here we get uh, the error warning or message so it's an error 200 no security definition has been found for the request and uh, we can see here that we have an empty list so here we have zero contracts and finally we have case uh, three so we have multiple possible contracts and uh, this will happen whenever we only pass for example the ticker symbol to stock and then if we pass uh, the contract to request contract details then we get a list of uh, contracts of possible contracts and uh, we can check the number of contracts and in total in this case here we have 30 contracts and now we can actually only get here the contract details so we can iterate 
over the list and get uh, the contract details. And uh, for example, we can do this with the list comprehension and uh, then we save the contracts and contracts. So here we have a list uh, with uh, the 30 contracts. And for example, we can select uh, the very first contract and this is uh, the contract Apple Smart Exchange and uh, US dollar. And as always, it's just best to actually visualize this in a pandas data frame. So this enhances uh, readability and uh, actually the wrapper package provides here a little uh, shortcut or helper function. So util.df and uh, if we pass here contracts, then the wrapper converts here the list into a pandas data frame. So this is so to say the shortcut for pd.dataframe. So let's have a look here. And here we have the data frame with uh, the 30 contracts. And uh, we can see the security types of stock and the contract IDs and the symbol and uh, the exchange. And also here the currency and uh, we have a US dollar but uh, theoretically we can also buy the Apple stock denominated in British pound or Canadian dollar. And uh, finally, let's have another example for a European stock, uh, Lufthansa. And uh, here intuitively, we should uh, pass uh, the ticker symbol, then smart and the Euro as currency. And let's check here. So I would uh, expect that uh, we have only one contract and uh, that's uh, the case here. And uh, we will continue with a little case study here in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, finally, let's buy and sell some stocks uh, with uh, the Interactive Brokers API. And first of all, I need to add here the following two disclaimers. So in this video, we will make a few random trades and therefore you should not run the following code with your live account. So just uh, with your paper trading account. And second, uh, please remind that you can't trade outside uh, the trading hours. So I know that many students learn on weekends or in the late evening, but uh, you should be aware of the trading hours. So if your trades doesn't work, then it's pretty likely that it is uh, due to the trading hours problem. So now let's start and let's import uh, pandas and also the wrapper and let's create a connection. And now let's assume that uh, we want to buy one Apple stock. Then we can create here the contract object. And uh, before we submit an order, we should actually check whether the contract is unambiguous. And uh, this is here the case. And uh, before we trade, first of all, let's go here to the working station. And uh, currently I have uh, one Microsoft stock, two Apple stocks and one Lufthansa stock here sitting on uh, my portfolio or account. And now let's uh, buy a third Apple stock with a market buy order. And uh, we can create an order object uh, with uh, market order. So a market order object and uh, the action is buy, so we want to buy. And then we have to specify the total quantity and number of shares. So we want to buy one share. So this is uh, the market order object. And then we can place an order with uh, IB place order. And uh, we have to pass here the contract and uh, the order. And uh, we save then the trade object in, for example, the variable trade. So let's simply run here the code. And here, if we immediately print uh, the trade object, then uh, the order status is uh, pending submit or not filled. So at uh, this time here, our order was uh, still not filled. And uh, there's typically a time lag between submitting the order and until the order is filled. And uh, the slack can be one second or a fraction of a second, but uh, maybe for other instruments uh, with uh, lower liquidity, it also can be a couple of seconds or even more. And therefore, before we check the trade, uh, we could sleep 
and uh, we shouldn't use here time.sleep so it's important to use here ib.sleep and for example we could sleep five seconds and then we can check the process of uh, the order and trade with trade.log and uh, the process started here so pending submit at 49 minutes and 25 seconds and uh, then a couple of microseconds later we have submitted the order and then after this uh, the order is getting filled and then finally the status is filled so we really have traded and we have bought uh, one stock and in this example it took uh, less than one second so 0 0.3 seconds and then we can check again the trade object and here we can see now that the status is filled so this is here the quantity so we have bought uh, one stock and uh, there's uh, zero shares remaining and uh, here we can then see uh, the average fill price 142.89 and uh, we can further go here inside and extract uh, data so for example we can go here to order status and status and this is filled or order status and average fill price 142.89 and then we can also check all trades of uh, the current uh, trading session so this session is typically uh, the current trading day and uh, there are a couple of trades here so this is a list with uh, the trades objects for all trades and uh, the same we can also do for the orders so we can check here all orders of uh, the current uh, trading session and obviously there's a lot of information then we can extract here from a trade object or, a, or an order object and now let's also cover here the market sell order so let's check here in the working station so now I have uh, three Apple shares in my account and now let's uh, reduce um, the position to two shares so let's sell one share and uh, we can do this uh, with a market sell order and uh, the total quantity is one and now as I said before between placing the order and uh, checking uh, the trade object we could uh, for example sleep one second and uh, then also here in this case uh, the status is filled so we have sold uh, one share at uh, the average fill price of 142.97 and one more time uh, we can check all trades so now we should uh, have uh, one additional trade so there is a time lag between uh, submitting the order and until the order is filled and uh, the time lag is uh, unknown in advance so it can be fractions of a second but it can be longer and uh, there's a way how we can actually wait until the order is uh, either filled or cancelled so we can do this here with a while loop so while the trade is not done we wait until the trade is done so this is a while loop and uh, we can also measure the time until the order is actually uh, filled and executed so we can do this here with the magic function time and uh, let's do this here one more time for a market buy order for one apple share and now again we should have here two shares and now we can buy one share here and uh, this was pretty quick here so 151 milliseconds and then we can get the trade details and finally we can also check uh, all filled uh, transaction all fills in uh, this session with uh, the fills uh, method and here we have a list with all fills and now we could actually convert uh, this into a data frame where each row is uh, actually one fill trade so we can pass to a uh, util.df the execution part of uh, the fill objects so here we have uh, the execution part and uh, if we first of all save the execution part in a list and then we can pass it to util.df 
And then for example here, so I have eight or nine trades in this uh, session. And here we can see the ID, the time, then the account number, the exchange, the site. So either buy, bought or sold, the number of shares, the price, and some more information. So this is how we can submit uh, market buy and market sell orders and how we can extract uh, data and information on the fill trades. Pretty simple actually. And uh, this, uh, this we have reached here the end of this uh, lecture. Let's disconnect and uh, see you in the next video. Bye. Now the Interactive Brokers API allows us to pull information and data on our current portfolio positions and account values. So let's go to the Trader Workstation. And uh, currently I have a couple of long and also short positions here in uh, my portfolio. So for example, I am short uh, one stock in uh, the Nike uh, stock. And uh, then I have one share in Lufthansa and I'm short uh, one share in Boeing and so on. And I do have 100,000 cash, Euro cash and a slightly negative uh, US dollar cash balance. And uh, of course I could offset uh, the negative uh, US dollar balance uh, with my Euro account at any time. And now let me demonstrate how we can get uh, this information here and uh, these positions into Python. So let's uh, create a connection and uh, with the method positions uh, we can get the current positions And uh, also here we can convert uh, this into a data frame uh, with the uh, util df. And uh, for example, here's uh, the long position in Lufthansa, the short position in Boeing. And uh, it uh, would be better to actually have a separate column for the symbol and maybe also a separate column for the contract ID. And therefore we can actually extract here the information from the contract uh, column and uh, we use here a lambda function to extract uh, the symbol and also uh, the contract ID. And uh, then by doing so, we create uh, the additional columns, symbol and contract ID. So here on the right. So we do have the column contract uh, with uh, some more information on the contract. Then we have uh, the pos position, so the number of uh, shares and whether it's uh, a long position, so positive or a short position negative, then we also have the average cost of uh, the trades and uh, the symbol and also the contract ID. And now we can also get uh, the account values. So for example, the cash balance with uh, the method account values. And here we can find a lot of information. So accrued cash, so a lot of things related to the margin, cash balance, currency, exchange rate, fund value, and many more things. So feel free to go here more into the detail, but uh, for now, let's actually also convert this into a data frame. And then, so here we have the tag and uh, the value and the currency. And then for example, if we are interested in our cash balance, we can actually filter DF2 for uh, the tag and it should be cash balance. And then we can see uh, the Euro cash balance, the US dollar cash balance, and actually the aggregated uh, cash balance in Euro. So it's here the positive Euro amount minus uh, the negative US dollar amount in Euro. So that's uh, the cash that uh, we actually have. So the net cash sitting on our account. So these were just a few examples how you can pull data and information on uh, your positions and account values into Python. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye. Now we can also load historical open, high, low, close uh, data via the Interactive Brokers API. And also here the problem is uh, that for some exchanges and instruments you need an extra subscription. So historical data for Forex is uh, free, but for stocks uh, you either need a live account or in addition a data subscription.
And that's why, in my opinion, for historical data, Interactive Brokers is only the second choice and uh, the first choice is Yahoo Finance. But now let me just demonstrate how you can load historical bars from Interactive Brokers. And uh, we start here with a connection. And then, for example, we could uh, create a contract object for uh, the currency pair Euro US Dollar. And then the method the request had timestamp allows us uh, to request the earliest uh, timestamp where data is available. So we can pass here, or we have to pass here the contract, and then uh, we can request it, uh, for example, for the midpoint, or alternatively, we could also request it for ask or for the bid price. And then we should set the use the regular trading hours to true. So by doing this, uh, we only take into account the regular trading hours and not extended uh, trading hours. And uh, we save the result in the variable start. So the earliest uh, timestamp for historical data for Euro US dollar is uh, the 9th of March at uh, 4.30. And uh, this is just to know how long we can go into the past here. And now we can load historical data with the method request historical data. And uh, we have to pass here the contract. And uh, then we could specify the end date time. And uh, if we don't specify this, then we can also set here the uh, duration string. So for example, we could get uh, the last 60 days and then with the bar size setting, we can determine the bar size or the frequency. So for example, daily data. And then also here we should set uh, use the regular trading hours to true. And uh, now let's save here the data in data. And also here we load uh, the midpoint prices, but alternatively, we could also select bid, ask, and some more other prices here. Now data is actually now a list with uh, bar data objects. So for each and every day, we have here one bar data object. And it definitely makes sense to convert uh, this into a data frame. And also here we can uh, use uh, util.df and pass data. And by doing so, we create here a pandas data frame with uh, the columns date. So we have here daily data for the last 60 days. Then we have open prices, high prices, low prices, and also close prices. Now we have seen that uh, one important parameter is uh, the uh, duration string parameter. And uh, here we can define uh, the time period or the time span of all the bars. And for example, we could select 10 years, 6 months, uh, 30 days, uh, 13 weeks, 60 seconds, and uh, many more. So for example, 4 months or whatever. So this means uh, that uh, we are completely flexible here. And second, uh, we have uh, the parameter bar size setting. So this is uh, the frequency of the bars. And here's uh, the set of possible settings here so from one second to five minutes one hour four hours one day one week one month so this is uh, pretty flexible here and uh, for example we could uh, request uh, the following intraday data so for the last day five minute bars and uh, here it's important to set the format date to true and uh, this actually returns uh, the time in uh, UTC time. So here we have UTC time, so relative to UTC time plus uh, zero hours and zero minutes relative to UTC time. So we have here 201 bars. And uh, we could also specify here local time. So for Euro, US dollar, local time would be US Eastern New York time. And for local time, we could pass here one, but uh, there seems to be a bug here. So if we do this, then we get here an attribute error. And uh, this uh, might getting fixed in one of the next updates. So for the time being, we can only request the UTC time by passing here two. And then if you want to convert to local time, we could do the following. So first of all, we can set the date as the index. 
and then we can convert uh, the time zone with the TZ uh, convert and uh, we could specify here US Eastern time. So now we have here New York time, which is obviously five hours behind uh, UTC time. So this was the requesting historical bars for Forex data. And now let's try to do the same also for US stocks like uh, Apple. So we create uh, the contract here. And then if we request the uh, daily data for the last 60 days midpoint, then we get here the error that we have no data permissions. And once again, for some markets, it is sufficient uh, to have a live account. And uh, for some markets, uh, in addition, we need a data subscription. But uh, again, I want to highlight here that uh, Yahoo Finance is uh, the number one data source for historical bars or historical price and volume data. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. Hi and welcome to this section on financial data analysis uh, with Python and Pandas. And uh, this is probably the most important section of uh, the complete course as uh, we will cover and build uh, the basics for all other sections. So you shouldn't skip that section here, even if you have already watched uh, one of my other courses, because I completely restructured, improved and uh, redid uh, the videos. And I also added more content and additional explanations. So this section is more than uh, just an introduction. It's a deep dive. And essentially there are two learning outcomes. So first of all, this section is a Python and uh, pandas coding refresher. So in the best case, uh, this is uh, just repetition for you. And second, and even more important, you will learn from scratch how to work with and how to analyze financial data. And I call this financial literacy. And it's just true that the vast majority is uh, just lacking financial literacy. And also you'll have uh, the chance to practice uh, what uh, you have learned. So there will be quite a lot of uh, coding exercises or coding challenges. So the next videos will cover and explain the must knows for traders and investors. So no matter if your ultimate goal is long-term investing, day trading, algo trading or whatever, the following concepts are must-haves when working with financial data. So we have uh, prices, uh, then normalized prices, simple returns, uh, logarithmic returns or short log returns, then arithmetic mean return, the geometric mean return, the compound annual growth rate, investment multiple. Then we have a compound returns, annualized returns, uh, discrete compounding versus continuous compounding. Then we have uh, the variance or the standard deviation of returns. And uh, there's a difference between uh, long position returns and uh, short position returns. And it's important uh, to know how to calculate the long and short position returns. And then we also have levered returns. So returns assuming uh, margin trading or leverage trading. And finally, we also have uh, portfolio returns. And uh, typically for those who don't have a background in finance and investing, most of uh, these concepts and uh, workflows are new. And it's uh, definitely not rocket science. But if you haven't heard of that before, then you simply don't know it, but uh, you should know it for trading and investing. And uh, even those uh, with a relevant background in uh, the financial industry will learn new things. So that's uh, guaranteed. Now, all these concepts here are somehow related, but different and uh, using the wrong one in the wrong situation can lead to wrong conclusions and wrong decisions. So in finance and uh, in trading and investing, even small errors in the input can lead to large errors in the output. And you can find many blogs and YouTube videos that uh, just do it wrong. So that's uh, maybe here the unofficial subtitle, not only for this section, but also for the whole course. So the most intuitive solution or the most intuitive way how to do it is uh, very often not the correct one. And therefore intuition is uh, definitely not your best friend 
so you should know how to do it and uh, therefore you should learn how to do it right thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lectures bye all right let's get started and let's load some financial data from the csv file multiassets.csv and uh, originally i have downloaded uh, these uh, assets from yahoo finance so theoretically you could get uh, the latest data for these assets with uh, yahoo finance so let's uh, load here the data from the csv file and uh, no surprise we have here a multi-index in the columns with uh, the outer index level and uh, the inner index level and Let's check here with uh, the info method. So we have a daytime index and uh, we have data from 2014 until mid of 2021. And uh, in total, we have here six instruments. Now the entire section is all about financial data analysis and performance evaluation and also performance comparison. And it's important to understand uh, that no matter if we analyze equities, indexes, commodities, cryptocurrencies or whatever, it works pretty much in the same way. So the methodologies and techniques are the same for all asset classes. So there are minor differences uh, which we will highlight uh, throughout uh, the section. So we have here different instruments coming from different asset classes because, and uh, that's uh, the ultimate goal, we should be able to compare the performance across uh, instruments and across different asset classes. And uh, for example, we have here two large uh, US stocks. So we have Boeing and we have Microsoft. Then we have uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average Index, so a stock index. And then we also have uh, the exchange rate for the currency per Euro US dollar. So Forex is uh, an asset class as well. So Forex stands for foreign exchange. And then also we have a commodity. So we have uh, the gold price. And last but not least, uh, we have Bitcoin in US dollar. So that's a cryptocurrency. And uh, for now we are only interested in uh, the close prices. So we have now here six columns and uh, we can get some more information with uh, the describe method. So the mean prices, the standard deviation and so on. And uh, we can also create a price chart for one instrument. So for example, for Boeing and uh, the performance is mixed here. So here we have a great performance and uh, then we have a steep decline here during the COVID-19 crisis. And finally, we can also plot all six instruments in one price chart. And uh, this is getting a bit messy because uh, the prices of uh, the instruments are simply on different scales. So if you check this here, then uh, we have uh, Boeing here around 250. Then we have Bitcoin around uh, 30,000 here mid of 2021. Then the currency Euro US dollar is on a completely different scale. So around one or 1.21, then we have gold 1,900, Microsoft 250, and finally the Dow Jones index at uh, 34,000. And actually, if we have another look here at uh, the price chart, then we can see that uh, we can't really compare here the performance of uh, different instruments. So just uh, with the price, uh, the absolute price, and therefore the take home message is here that uh, absolute prices are absolutely meaningless or useless. So in the vast majority of cases to actually compare instruments. And uh, the reason for this is uh, that the prices are typically on different scales and it's simply hard to compare. And a higher price level does not imply a higher value or a better performance. So we need to find uh, metrics other than absolute prices to compare different instruments across different asset classes. And uh, that's uh, the plan for the next lectures. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In the last lecture, we have seen that uh, we can't really use absolute prices to compare the performance of financial instruments. 
And uh, one solution could be to normalize prices to a base value of, for example, 100. Or in other words, uh, all instruments shall start at uh, the very same level. So, for example, the value 100. And uh, we still have saved here the data frame close uh, with uh, the close prices for all six instruments. And uh, again, we can see that uh, they are on completely different scales or levels. So for example, Euro US dollar starts at 1.26. And in contrast to that, uh, the Dow Jones index starts at a value of uh, 16,800. And uh, the plan is now that we normalize all six uh, time series to a base value of 100. So they all start at uh, a value of 100. And uh, first of all, let's do this uh, for one instrument, for example, Boeing. And uh, with iLOG, we can get uh, the very first price, 124.67. So this is uh, the first price of Boeing. And uh, now if we divide all prices of Boeing by the very first price, we normalize uh, the Boeing prices to a base value of one. So let's do this here. So we use here the diff method and uh, we divide all prices by the very first price. And it's no surprise uh, that uh, we get the value one on uh, the 1st of October. Then one day later, we are at 0 0.99. And uh, finally, after seven years, uh, we end up at 1.98. And uh, the practical interpretation is uh, pretty simple. So if we had invested $1 in the Boeing stock, in 2014, then we would end up at $1.98 in uh, the year 2021. So we almost doubled our investment and uh, typically you will see a base value of uh, 100. So we can uh, multiply all values or all elements here with 100 uh, with the MAL method. And uh, then we start at 100, then one day later we are at uh, 99.59 and uh, after seven years uh, we end up at 198.13. So this is how it works uh, for one instrument and uh, now let's do this for all six instruments. And again with iLog0 we can get uh, the first prices for all instruments. So this is uh, the first row here. And uh, then we can divide uh, the closed data frame by the first row with uh, the diff method and uh, multiply with 100. And uh, by doing so, we create a data frame with normalized prices and uh, we save the data frame in uh, the variable norm. And here you can see all instruments start at a base value of 100. And uh, then finally, after seven years, the Boeing stock, for example, ends at 198 and the Bitcoin at 9,300. And already here we can see that Bitcoin showed the best performance and Euro US dollar the worst performance. So to say we lost here 3.5 dollars, so from 100 to 96.5. And also here it's best uh, to just uh, visualize uh, this here. So we use uh, the norm data frame, we drop uh, missing values and uh, we plot the six uh, time series. And uh, still it's difficult to compare the six uh, time series as uh, the performance of the Bitcoin is so much uh, better than uh, the other five instruments. And uh, there's a little trick here, so we can change uh, the scale of uh, the y-axis and uh, we can create a logarithmic scale. And uh, we can do this here with uh, the log y parameter. So the default setting is false, but uh, we can set uh, this to true. And uh, by doing so, we create here a logarithmic scale with 100, 1000, 10,000. And uh, now let's have a closer look at uh, Bitcoin here in green. So it's uh, true that uh, Bitcoin provides uh, the highest reward in uh, the period from 2014 till 2021, as it allows us uh, to turn $100, so an initial investment of 100, into around about $10,000.
However, if you only consider the years uh, 2014 and uh, 2015, then uh, we come to a completely different conclusion. And also we can see that uh, the Bitcoin price is a lot more volatile than, uh, for example, uh, the gold price here. So with uh, the Bitcoin, there's a higher chance to make high profits, but also a higher chance uh, for high losses. And uh, to really measure and compare all those aspects, we need to work with the relative price changes rather than with prices. And uh, those relative price changes are also called returns. And uh, that's uh, the plan for the next lectures. But uh, finally, we also have a take home message here. So normalized prices help to compare financial instruments. So at a first glance here with a nice chart, but uh, they are still limited when it comes to measuring and comparing the performance in more detail. And uh, finally, before we move on, let's also save uh, the closed data frame in a CSV file. So close.csv and uh, then we can use uh, the close prices in uh, one of the next lectures. So let's run the cell here and uh, I will see you in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. Hi and welcome to coding challenge number one. So from time to time uh, you will have the chance to practice uh, what you have learned so far. And in uh, this first exercise you have to load the stock price data for General Electric or short GE and another ticker symbol of your choice for the time period from 2015 till the end of 2020. And again you can check uh, the ticker symbol here on the Yahoo Finance website. And uh, for instruments traded outside uh, the US, you have to add a country or exchange uh, suffix to the ticker symbol. And uh, I've provided here a link with uh, the suffix list. So let's have a look here. And uh, for instruments traded on US stock exchanges like the NASDAQ, there's no need to add a suffix. But uh, for other instruments, so for example, for Indian stocks uh, that are traded on the National Stock Exchange of India, you have to add uh, the suffix .ns. So let's have a look and let's have an example. And let's assume that uh, you want to pull data for the Indian company reliance. Then we can check this here. So it's uh, the Indian company reliance industries limited. And uh, the ticker symbol is the reliance.ns. So this is uh, the first step, getting stock price data for GE and another ticker symbol of your choice. Then next, uh, you should only select the close prices and uh, create a price chart for GE. And finally, uh, you should uh, normalize the stock prices and uh, visualize and uh, the question is here, what's uh, the final normalized price for GE on uh, the 30th of uh, December 2020? And actually you should uh, select here a base value of one for the very first day. So that's uh, the very first coding challenge. And uh, you can find uh, the solution for the coding challenges at uh, the end of this notebook. And uh, for this uh, very first coding challenge, let me just uh, go through the solution. So let's go to the end of the notebook. And here we have coding challenge number one. And uh, first of all, we import pandas, Y finance and uh, matplotlib. And uh, we have uh, the start date, uh, the 2nd of January, 2015 and uh, the end date. So the last day of uh, 2020. And uh, I've selected here the Reliance uh, stock, Reliance.ns and uh, GE. And uh, with this we can download price data with uh, Yfinance.download. And uh, we can save the raw data frame with the raw data in the variable df. So that's a data frame uh, with a multi-index here in the columns. And now we select uh, close prices only for GE and Reliance, so the daily close prices. And then we can plot uh, GE close prices 
by selecting here GE and uh, we drop rows uh, with missing values. So that's uh, the GE stock price over time. So starting here at the 24 and ending at uh, about 11 or 12. And then we can normalize the prices to a base value of one. So we divide uh, the closed data frame by the very first row. And uh, this is not really required here. It's just more explicit. So we have a base value of one and uh, we create uh, the normalized data frame norm and uh, both the time series are starting at a value of one. And uh, then six years later, we end up at a normalized price of 0.44. So the price more than halved. And in the contrast to that, uh, we see a pretty good performance for Reliance. And uh, the stock price increased by a factor of more than four. So we end up at 4.54. And uh, the answer here for GE is so that uh, the final price is 0.44. And finally, we can also compare GE and uh, Reliance. And uh, we can see here that uh, the performances are closely together until 2017. But uh, then uh, Reliance uh, clearly outperformed uh, the GE stock. But as a side note, uh, we have to take into account here that uh, the performance of uh, the GE stock is in a US dollar currency and uh, the performance of uh, the Reliance stock in Indian currency. So this was coding challenge number one. I hope you had fun. Thanks uh, for watching and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye. We have learned that normalized prices can help to compare the performance of uh, different financial instruments However, in finance, it's all about price changes and uh, relative price changes or percentage changes are also called financial returns. And in the vast majority of cases, financial analysts, investors and traders work with uh, returns and uh, not uh, with absolute prices. And uh, this finding is a no-brainer for those who worked in the financial industry before, but it can be a surprise for those who are completely new to this business. So price changes are more meaningful or useful than prices. And uh, now let's start. Uh, let's import pandas, uh, matplotlib. And uh, let's import uh, the closed prices from the CSV file close.csv. So here we have uh, the daily closed prices for the six instruments. And uh, now in this lecture, let's focus on uh, the Microsoft stock. So we select uh, Microsoft, uh, then we drop rows uh, with uh, missing values. So in particular weekends and uh, bank holidays. And then we make sure that uh, we have a data frame with uh, one column. And finally we make a copy. So we don't want to change here the original data frame close. And uh, we save uh, the new data frame in uh, Microsoft. So that's here Microsoft. And then we could also change a column header here. So these are the prices uh, for Microsoft. And uh, we could uh, rename here the column header to price. And uh, we can do this uh, with uh, the rename method. And uh, we want to change uh, a column label and uh, the old label is MSFT and uh, the new one price. And uh, we shouldn't forget uh, to set in place to true. So now we have your price. Next, we can shift the elements in a column by a desired number of periods with the shift method. So there's uh, the parameter periods. And if we set uh, this to one, then uh, we shift uh, the prices uh, forward by one day. So on uh, the 2nd of October, we have uh, yesterday's price that uh, we had on the first 45.9. So with the positive integers, uh, we shift uh, the elements forwards and uh, with the negative uh, values uh, backwards. And uh, then for example, we can create an additional column, price lag one. So that's uh, the price, uh, the yesterday's price. And uh, we use here shift uh, periods equals one. So here we have for the current price and uh, the lagged price. So to say the price uh, one day before and uh, with this we can calculate absolute price changes, so to say the difference. And for example, here 
between uh, the first two days, the price difference is uh, negative. So we have a decrease in price from 45.9 to 45.76. And uh, we can calculate the difference by subtracting uh, the price lag like one from the price. So we can do this for example with uh, the sub method. So we subtract uh, the price lag like from the price and uh, we create uh, the additional column price difference. And uh, that's uh, the first alternative how we can calculate price differences. So here from the first till the second day, we have a negative price difference, a price decrease of minus 0.14. Then in the next day, we have a price increase from 45.7 to 46.1. So that's an increase of 0.33. And the pandas provides also a special method to calculate uh, differences. And it's no surprise that uh, this is uh, the diff method. And also here we have to determine uh, the number of periods. So one period. And uh, we calculate here uh, the column price difference too. And uh, we would expect uh, that those two columns are equal. And uh, this is uh, the case. But uh, we can also check this in more detail with uh, the equals method. So we check whether the uh, price difference column equals uh, the price difference uh, to column. And uh, this is uh, the case here. So we can calculate uh, the price change uh, from one day to the next day with uh, the diff method. However, absolute price changes have one major drawback. So we can't uh, really compare absolute price changes across instruments. So let's assume that uh, we have a price change of uh, 10 units. And uh, now the question is, is uh, this a large uh, price change or not? And uh, the best answer is it depends. So a price change uh, by 10 units uh, from 10 to 20 is a large or huge change. And in contrast, an increase from 500 to 510 is rather small. So it depends on the absolute price level. And therefore absolute price changes are not uh, really meaningful. And again in finance it's all about the relative or percentage uh, price changes also called the financial returns. And instead of subtracting the price lag one from the price, we should uh, divide the price by the price lag one. So this is uh, the first alternative how we can calculate uh, relative changes. And let's cross out, out here minus one. And uh, for example, here from the second to the third, we have uh, a relative change of 0 0.0072. And it definitely makes sense uh, to subtract here one. So this is uh, the relative uh, price change. So from the 1st of October to the 2nd of October, we have a negative return. And uh, then we have a positive return. Then we have uh, no return, a zero. And also here Pandas provides a built-in method for this, the percentage change method. And uh, we apply the percentage change method on uh, the price column. And again, we uh, have here periods equals one. And uh, then we create uh, the column returns. So these are the financial returns. And now let's just consider the financial return from the second to the third one more time. So on the third, uh, we have a price of 46.09 and on the second, it was 45.76. So if we divide uh, those two numbers minus one, we get uh, the relative uh, change. So to say the percentage change and if we multiply this uh, with 100, we get uh, the relative change in percent. So we have 0.72%. So we can either say that uh, the return is 0 0.0072 or 0.72%. So this is uh, the same. And in this course, we typically use uh, this notation here. So the price change is 0 0.0072. Now the take home message of uh, this lecture is that uh, relative price changes, also called financial returns, are meaningful and uh, comparable across instruments. Because a percentage change is independent from the absolute price level, so a 20% price increase has uh, the same meaning across all instruments, and it doesn't matter if uh, the stock price is 5 or 5,000. And uh, just as a side note, uh, the concept of returns is uh, pretty similar, 
as uh, the concept of an interest rate. So when you go to your bank and ask for a mortgage loan to buy a new home, you will get an interest rate quote like uh, 3% or 5% and not an absolute interest amount of uh, $10,000 or $50,000 or whatever, because uh, the absolute interest amount depends on uh, the loan size. So that's a useful analogy for the take home message here. Finally, let's drop here for the next uh, lectures, uh, price like one, price difference and the price difference to the columns with uh, the drop method. And uh, this is now the Microsoft data frame with the prices and returns. And uh, we save and store this data frame here in a separate CSV file, Microsoft.csv. And uh, with uh, this, we have reached uh, the end of this lecture. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next one. Bye. In this lecture, you will learn how to measure reward and risk of an investment. And uh, the following rule is probably the most fundamental rule in the industry. So higher risk must be rewarded with higher returns. And uh, investors would not invest their money into stocks if the expected uh, returns were not greater than the interest rate offered by a savings bank. So if uh, the expected returns for both was, for example, 3%, you would rather bring your money to the savings bank and uh, that's uh, less risky than buying stocks because the prices of stocks can go up and down significantly. So let's start coding and let's import pandas, numpy and also matplotlib and uh, let's load uh, the Microsoft uh, data frame with uh, the prices and uh, the returns and uh, then again we can plot or create a price uh, chart for Microsoft. So that's uh, the price from 215 or end of 214 until mid of uh, 221. And you can see that uh, there was a clear uptrend and uh, prices increased from around about 50 to 250. However, this chart is uh, not a straight line or a straight curve. And uh, there are quite a few temporary retracements where prices fall. So here, here, and uh, here and in particular here. So that's uh, the COVID-19 crisis here. And even if uh, there's a general uptrend here, you would have made uh, severe losses if you had invested here and uh, divested here. And again, price charts do not form a straight line or straight curve because prices uh, can rise and fall and uh, returns can be positive and negative and uh, the overall term for this is uh, volatility or risk and uh, everything else equal, investors prefer less risk. So in any investment, uh, there are two major aspects, uh, the reward, which is uh, positive returns and uh, the risk, which is uh, the volatility of returns. And uh, the plan is now to measure reward in one single number and also the risk in one single number and uh, there exist uh, various performance metrics uh, for reward and risk, but uh, the most well-known and the most popular ones are the arithmetic mean return for the reward and uh, the standard deviation of returns for the risk or the volatility. And uh, first of all, we can get uh, some summary statistics on the numerical columns uh, with uh, the describe method. So first we have the count, which is uh, the number of non-missing values. And uh, we have here one missing value in uh, the return column. So no surprise, the first value is missing here. And then we have uh, the arithmetic mean or more simple, the average. And uh, here we have average prices and average returns. And uh, average uh, prices are more or less meaningless. However, the mean return is actually uh, the uh, performance metric number one for the reward. So the arithmetic mean return, and uh, this is here 0.12% uh, per day. So on a daily basis, and uh, we can also calculate uh, this explicitly. So we have here a daily mean return of 0.1159%. Then next uh, we have uh, the standard deviation of returns. And also here, the standard deviation of prices is meaningless but uh, the standard deviation of uh, returns is uh, the number one metric for the risk or the volatility. 
And uh, for Microsoft, the, the standard deviation of daily returns is 1.73%. Uh, and uh, we can also calculate uh, this here separately with uh, the STD method. And actually, as variable names, uh, we use here the Greek letters mu and uh, sigma. So this is uh, just a convention. And as a side note, uh, the standard deviation is uh, simply the square root of uh, the variance. So we can calculate uh, the variance of uh, daily uh, returns and then take uh, the square root uh, with np.sqrt and uh, this gives uh, the same volatility. So this is uh, the daily mean return for the Microsoft stock and uh, the standard deviation of daily returns. And uh, we have uh, some more summary statistics here in the describe method. So we have uh, the minimum and uh, the lowest return, the lowest or the worst the daily return was minus 14%. And uh, the best day was plus 14.2%. And then we have uh, the 25th percentile, the 50th percentile, which is also called the median, and uh, the 75th percentile. So there's uh, quite a few math and uh, statistics involved in uh, these uh, calculations here. And if you want to know more details, you can go to the appendix where terms like the variance or the standard deviation are explained in more detail. But uh, for the time being, we have reached uh, the end of this lecture. So we calculated uh, the arithmetic mean return and uh, the standard deviation of returns. And uh, now we have uh, one single number for the reward and uh, the risk of uh, the Microsoft stock for the time period between October to 14 and uh, mid of uh, 221. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. In this lecture, we are going to cover two alternative performance metrics, uh, the investment multiple and uh, the compound annual growth rate. And uh, these two are reward metrics, so they don't tell us anything about risk. And uh, compared to the arithmetic mean return, the benefit of uh, these two metrics is that uh, they are more intuitive and uh, easier to interpret. So for example, an arithmetic mean return of 0.1% based on daily returns is uh, not uh, really intuitive, at least at a first glance. And therefore it can make sense to consider the multiple or uh, the compound annual growth rate to uh, compare uh, financial instruments and uh, to measure performance. So let's start coding and uh, we import pandas and numpy and also matplotlib. And uh, we import uh, the Microsoft uh, CSV file with uh, prices and uh, returns. And then let's start uh, with uh, the investment multiple. And uh, the investment multiple is simply the ending value of uh, an initial investment of uh, one, for example, dollar, or it could be euro or whatever. And uh, we can simply calculate uh, the multiple with uh, the ending value divided uh, by the initial investment. So in our case um, here, the uh, multiple for Microsoft uh, for the period 240 until 221 is uh, 249.68 divided by 45.9. So the last price uh, divided by the first price. And uh, here the multiple is 5.44. And uh, we could also say that by investing in the Microsoft stock in October 2014, we uh, turned $1 into $5.44 until the end of May 2021. And uh, this means an increase of 443.96%. So based on the multiple, we can also calculate the total price increase in percent by subtracting one and then multiplying with 100. And actually the investment multiple and uh, a normalized price with a base value of one. So these are similar, if not identical concepts. So we have learned before that uh, we can uh, normalize uh, the price uh, to a base value by dividing each and every price by the initial price. And then we get uh, the normalized price over time, starting with one and ending at uh, the final investment multiple of 5.43. So this is uh, the investment multiple and uh, there's one major drawback of the multiple. 
So it doesn't take into account uh, the investment period and it's uh, meaningful only uh, in uh, connection with uh, the investment period. So realizing an investment multiple of 5.44 over a time period of uh, seven years is great, but uh, the same multiple over a investment period of 100 years is uh, not that great. And uh, therefore we have to take into account also the investment period. And that's actually the benefit of the compound annual growth rate. So this takes into account also the investment period. And uh, taken from Wikipedia, so the definition of the compound annual growth rate is as follows. So this is uh, the constant annual rate of return that uh, would be required for an investment to grow from its beginning balance to its ending balance assuming that the profits were reinvested at the end of each year of the investment's lifespan. So in simple words, the compound annual growth rate, as the name says, is a kind of an annualized return metric, and it takes into account the investment period. And to calculate the compound annual growth rate, first of all, we have to define the start date. And this is the 1st of October, 2014, and uh, the end date. And then we can actually calculate uh, the time difference uh, by subtracting uh, the start from the end date. And uh, we have here timestamp objects, so we can subtract timestamp objects and uh, we get here a time delta object. So the time delta is uh, 2,431 days. And assuming that on average a year has uh, 365 point uh, two five days then uh, the time delta in the years is as follows so we have 6.65 years and having now the investment multiple of uh, 5.43 and uh, the number of years 6.65 we can calculate uh, the compound annual growth rate and uh, this is simply the multiple to the power of uh, one divided by the number of years minus one. So this is uh, the short version. And uh, this gives a compound annual growth rate of 28.97%. Uh, now there's also a long version how we can calculate uh, the compound annual growth rate starting uh, with a pandas data frame. So if uh, we haven't uh, calculated the multiple and uh, the time difference, then uh, this is here the more complex calculation. So we have here the multiple, then uh, we have here the number of uh, years. And then again, of course, we get uh, the very same result, 28.97%. And then we could make uh, the inverse calculation and uh, calculate uh, the multiple with uh, the compound annual growth rate and uh, the number of years. So the multiple is simply one plus uh, the compound annual growth rate. So this is 1.289 to the power of uh, 6.65. And uh, this uh, gives also the multiple of 5.43. So to sum up, uh, the compound annual growth rate is useful because uh, we can use it uh, to compare investments uh, with uh, different investment horizons. And uh, for example, we can calculate uh, the multiple if uh, we have uh, the investment horizon. And with this, we have reached uh, the end of this lecture. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in uh, the next video. Bye. All right, let's continue with uh, two additional return concepts, compound returns and uh, the geometric mean return. And uh, we still have saved uh, the Microsoft data frame with uh, prices and returns. And uh, now there's also a third alternative how we can calculate uh, the multiple. And uh, we can actually also compound the daily returns. And uh, this means uh, that we can add one to each and every daily return. And uh, this gives here 0 0.99, 1.0072 and so on. And uh, now if we multiply all those elements up, then uh, we get uh, the multiple. And uh, we can actually do this uh, with uh, the prod method. So the prod method multiplies um, all elements here. And uh, again, we get 5.44. Now let's move on and let's determine uh, the number of elements in uh, the returns column. So in total, we have 
1676 returns. So we have used here the count method and uh, with uh, this we can calculate uh, the geometric mean return and uh, the formula is as follows. So the geometric mean return is uh, the multiple to the power of uh, 1 divided by n minus 1. So n is here the number of elements 1676 and this gives a geometric mean return based on daily returns of uh, 0.001 or in other words, 0.1%. Uh, and also here we can make uh, the inverse calculation and uh, we can compound uh, the geometric mean return and uh, add one and then uh, to the power of 1676. And uh, this is uh, the fourth alternative how we can calculate uh, the multiple of 5.44. And actually the geometric mean return has a similar definition as uh, the compound annual growth rate. So the only difference is uh, that in our case, uh, the geometric mean return is uh, based on uh, daily data. So we could say that uh, the uh, geometric mean return is uh, the constant daily rate of return that uh, would be required for investment to grow from its uh, beginning balance to its ending balance, assuming the profits were reinvested at uh, the end of each day of uh, the investment's uh, lifespan. And uh, with this you can see that uh, the concepts of compound return, compound annual growth rate and uh, the geometric mean return, so these are closely related concepts. And uh, now let's compare this uh, to the arithmetic mean return. So we have learned before that uh, we can calculate uh, mu by just using here the mean method on uh, the returns and uh, this gives uh, 0.11%. And uh, compared to the geometric mean return, we can say that uh, the arithmetic mean return is always greater than the geometric mean return. So we have here 0.11% and uh, the geometric mean return is 0.1%. Uh, so the arithmetic mean return is slightly higher than the geometric mean return. and uh, it's also less useful so there's no way that uh, we can calculate uh, the multiple just uh, with uh, the arithmetic mean return so if we try to compound uh, the arithmetic mean return with uh, for example the following uh, formula then we don't end up at uh, the multiple and uh, that's a general finding that uh, we can't really use uh, the arithmetic mean return for further calculations so it's better to use uh, the geometric mean or even better we should work with uh, logarithmic returns and uh, therefore we will cover that in, in the next couple of lectures. Thanks for watching and uh, see you there. Bye. For some good reasons many traders work with the logarithmic returns or short log returns rather than simple returns. So until now we worked uh, with the so-called simple returns and uh, later in this section, we will see that log returns have some favorable characteristics. And at the, the same time, simple returns have uh, some drawbacks. And uh, we have already seen one example. So we can't really use uh, the arithmetic mean of simple returns for further calculations. However, the problem is uh, that many students and practitioners feel uncomfortable with log returns as uh, they don't really understand uh, the full background and intuition behind log returns. And also many view uh, the logarithm as a kind of a strange math concept from early high school or college days. And uh, typically they think that it's getting more complex uh, with log returns, which is clearly untrue. So you will see that many workflows are a lot easier with log returns. And uh, therefore on this course, we will heavily use uh, log returns. But uh, before, let me give you uh, some more detailed background on log returns in the next uh, two lectures. And uh, we start uh, with uh, discrete and continuous compounding and uh, the difference between those two. So let's start here with discrete compounding and let's consider the following case. So your savings bank offers you an interest rate of 8% per year. That's uh, the stated rate with annual compounding on your savings account. So let's assume that uh, your initial saving is $100 
and uh, your bank offers you 8% uh, with annual compounding, which means uh, that uh, the interest accrues once a year at uh, the end of the year. So to say interests are calculated and added uh, to uh, your savings account once uh, at uh, the end of each year. And uh, the question is now we should calculate uh, the value of our savings account after one year. And also we should calculate uh, the corresponding effective annual interest rate, which uh, could be different uh, from the stated rate. So let's have a look here. And uh, first of all, we start here with uh, the present value. So the current value of our savings account, $100, and uh, the stated rate is 8%. And uh, we consider one year. So we want to know the value after one year. And uh, simply calculate it, uh, the value after one year is 100 times 1.08, which gives $108. And uh, this is uh, the more formal solution with a formula. So we have the present value times one plus R to the power of N. And uh, this gives uh, the future value after one year, which is 108. And then we can also calculate uh, the effective annual interest rate. And uh, this is simply uh, the future value divided by the initial value to the power of one divided by N minus one. And uh, in case we have annual compounding, the stated rate is equal to the effective uh, interest rate. So these are just your rounding issues. So the effective annual interest rate is identical to the stated rate, 8%. So this was annual compounding and now let's move on with the quarterly compounding. So interests accrue once a quarter at uh, the end of the quarter. And uh, so to say, in uh, one year, we have uh, four interest uh, events. So at uh, the end of each quarter, and uh, this is uh, the very same case, but instead of having annual compounding, now we have uh, quarterly compounding. And also here, we have to calculate uh, the value after one year and uh, the effective annual interest rate. So interests are calculated and added uh, to our savings account at uh, the end of each quarter. And again, uh, the initial value of our savings account is 100. The stated rate is uh, still 8%. We consider one year. But uh, now instead of having one compounding event, we have uh, four compounding events, m equals four. And uh, simply calculated uh, the value after one year is as follows. So after one quarter, we earn uh, 2%, which is eight divided by four. So after one quarter, we end up at 102. And then three months later, we have another compounding event. And again, we earn 2%, but now on 102 instead of 100. And this is also called interest on interest or compound interest. And then we have another compounding event and a final compounding event after one year. And uh, we end up at 108.24, which is higher than the 108 here with the annual compounding. And uh, this is here the more formal way. So the future value is equal to the present value times 1 plus R divided by M to the power of N times M. So this is the number of quarters for. And also here we get 108.25. And finally, we can also calculate uh, the effective annual interest rate, which is again uh, the future value divided by the present value to the power of one divided by n. And uh, this gives 8.24% per year. So with uh, quarterly compounding, we end up at a higher value and also we have a higher effective interest rate. And uh, therefore, quarterly compounding is uh, favorable for us as a saver, everything else equal. And uh, the difference between quarterly compounding and annual compounding, also to say the benefit of quarterly compounding is uh, that we earn compound interest. So interest on interest. So for example, here, after six months, uh, we will earn uh, 2% not only on the initial uh, saving of 100, but also 2% on uh, the interest uh, that we earned after the first quarter. And uh, that's uh, compound interest. And uh, that's uh, the difference here. And finally, we can also have a look at monthly compounding. 
So here interest accrues so once a month at the end of the month. And here M is now 12. So we have 12 compounding events. And uh, it's no surprise uh, that we end up at a slightly higher value. So 108.29. And also the effective annual interest rate is slightly higher. Now this was uh, the concept of uh, discrete uh, compounding. So we have uh, discrete compounding events or a number of uh, compounding events uh, that we can count. So in case of annual we have one event. In case of uh, quarterly we have four compounding events. And if we have monthly compound compounding we have uh, 12 uh, compounding events. And uh, we could further increase compounding events to, for example, daily. So in this case, uh, then we have uh, 365, or uh, typically it's uh, 360 compounding events. And uh, when we further increase uh, the number of compounding events uh, to indefinite, then we end up at continuous compounding. And uh, we will have a look at uh, continuous compounding in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In the last lecture, we started with annual compounding and then we reduced uh, the compounding period to quarterly and then finally to monthly and uh, the limit of uh, this exercise as uh, the compounding period is getting shorter and shorter is called continuous compounding where uh, the compounding period uh, gets infinitely small and uh, the number of compounding events infinitely large. Now we still consider the very same case. So we start uh, with uh, a savings account or savings of $100 and uh, we have a stated rate of 8%. And now we consider continuous compounding and uh, we want to know uh, the value of our savings account after one year and uh, the corresponding effective uh, annual interest rate with uh, continuous uh, compounding and uh, we need a numpy here. And still we have uh, $100, 8% uh, one year. And uh, first of all, we make an approximation here. So we assume that uh, M gets infinitely large. So for example, 100,000. And with uh, this, we can still use uh, the discrete uh, compounding formula with a very large M. So this is an approximation and a very good approximation. So we end up here at 108.328. But uh, now let's move on with exact math and uh, the exact formula. So we can calculate uh, the future value with uh, present value times np.exp. And uh, this is uh, e to the power of n times r. So E stands uh, for the Euler number. And I guess you have seen uh, the Euler number before. So it's uh, 2.71 uh, something. And uh, we can explicitly get uh, the Euler number by passing one to np.exp. So this calculates E to the power of one, which is E. So the Euler number 2.7182 and so on. And uh, now let's calculate here the future value with exact math. So we have uh, PV times E to the power of N times R. So R is uh, the annual stated rate and N the number of years. And uh, we end up at 108.3287. And uh, this is slightly higher than the approximation here, no surprise. And of course we could write uh, the calculation as follows. So PV times uh, the Euler number to the power of N times R. So this is uh, the value after one year with continuous compounding. And now let's also calculate uh, the effective annual rate. And also here we can use uh, the formula that uh, we derived in uh, the last lecture. So that's uh, the first alternative. But uh, the more simple alternative is simply to have np.x uh, and pass r minus one. So e to the power of r, e to the power of uh, the stated annual rate minus one gives uh, the effective annual interest rate. And uh, everything else equal, we can maximize uh, the effective annual interest rate with uh, continuous compounding. 
So this is also called continuous exponential growth uh, that uh, we can observe in nature. And finally, let's assume that uh, we can only observe uh, the present value 100 and uh, the future value 108.32. Uh, then the question is now, how can we calculate and derive the stated rate that is also called uh, the continuously compounded rate of 8%. So this is uh, kind of uh, the inverse calculation and uh, we can get uh, the 8% uh, with np.log. So we can take uh, the natural logarithm of uh, future value divided by the present value. And uh, this gives 8%. So let's have a look here inside np.log. It calculates uh, the natural logarithm. And alternatively, we can also pass uh, the effective annual rate uh, plus one to np.log to get uh, the stated rate or the continuously compounded rate of 8%. Now, finally, to sum up, uh, we can typically observe discrete compounding in bank and uh, capital market uh, fixed income products like loans, uh, savings accounts and bonds. But in contrast to that, the prices of traded financial instruments so that are traded on exchanges change approximately continuously. So let's assume that uh, this is uh, not a savings account, but uh, a stock where uh, yesterday's price was 100 and today's price is 108.32. Then uh, there's no single compounding event, but uh, the price continuously changed uh, from 100 to 108.32. And therefore, it makes a lot of sense uh, to assume uh, continuous uh, compounding and uh, to calculate uh, the uh, continuously compounded uh, return, which is also called uh, the log return. So intuitively, it makes a lot of sense to work with the log returns if uh, we work uh, with the traded financial instruments. And uh, we will continue with log returns in the very next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. All right, let's calculate daily log returns for Microsoft and uh, we import pandas and numpy. And then we import uh, data for Microsoft from the CSV file, microsoft.csv. So here we have daily prices and uh, daily simple returns. So these are the simple returns. And uh, now we can create an additional column log returns and we can calculate daily returns uh, with uh, the following code. So we have np.log and uh, then we have here the price divided uh, by the previous price. So here on the right hand side, uh, we now have uh, the log returns. And if we compare simple returns and log returns, we can see that uh, they have uh, the same order of magnitude, but uh, still they are different. And in finance and investment, even small differences do matter. And we can even better see the differences with uh, aggregated numbers. So let's get uh, some summary statistics uh, with the scribe. And uh, then here we have uh, the daily mean return, uh, the arithmetic mean. And uh, this is a lot different here. So for simple returns, so we have a mean of uh, 0.116%. And uh, for the log returns, we have 0.10%. So with regard to the arithmetic mean or the average, there is a significant difference between uh, simple returns and log returns. However, the risk is uh, the same or more or less uh, the same. So there's actually no real difference here. And finally, we can also calculate uh, the mean log return explicitly with uh, the mean method. So that's the mu here. And then we can also calculate uh, the risk or the volatility based on log returns with uh, the STD method. And in the next lecture, we will cover more differences between simple returns and log returns. And in particular, I will show you the benefits or the advantages of uh, log returns. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. There are quite a few reasons why working with log returns rather than simple returns can be beneficial. And in this lecture, I will demonstrate uh, probably the most important aspect. And I will use a very simple example. So let's assume that uh, we consider a stock 
and its stock price for a period of two years. So at the, the beginning, the stock price is 100. Then after one year, the price is 50. So it uh, drops to 50 and then it increases again to 90 after two years. And uh, first of all, we should add uh, two additional columns. So one column uh, with uh, the simple returns. And again, as a repetition, uh, we can calculate simple returns uh, with uh, the percentage change method. And then we also add uh, log returns by taking the logarithm of uh, price divided by the shifted price. So here we have simple returns and log returns. And uh, here in this extreme example, we can see a huge difference between uh, the simple returns and the log returns. So minus 50% uh, versus minus almost 70% and uh, plus 80% uh, versus uh, plus 58%. And uh, the number of periods here is of course two. So we have here two years and uh, two returns. And uh, now let's continue with uh, the arithmetic mean of simple returns. And uh, this can be actually misleading. And let me demonstrate this. So with uh, the mean method, we can calculate uh, the arithmetic mean of simple returns. And uh, surprisingly, this is plus 15%. So even if we lose here $10 in two years, the arithmetic mean return is positive plus 15%. And uh, this is completely misleading. And uh, the problem is so that uh, the single period returns minus 50 and plus 80% are calculated on different base values. So minus 50% uh, on uh, the base value of 100 and uh, plus 80% based on 50. And uh, simple returns don't take into account uh, this change in the underlying base. And therefore we get here a completely misleading arithmetic mean and therefore, as we have learned before, we can't uh, use uh, the arithmetic mean of simple returns for further calculations. So there's actually no chance to calculate uh, the final value of 90 only with uh, the beginning value of 100 and uh, the arithmetic mean. So for example, we could calculate 100 times uh, 1 plus 15% to the power of the number of periods. But of course, here we don't get the 90, we get uh, 132 which is uh, far away from 90 actually. So the arithmetic mean of simple returns can be misleading. And now instead of using the arithmetic mean, we could also use uh, the geometric mean by compounding uh, simple returns. So compound simple returns and uh, the geometric mean are related concepts because we can calculate uh, the geometric mean by compounding the simple returns so this is here compounding simple returns. And then if we calculate it to the power of one divided by the number of periods, minus one, we get uh, the geometric mean, which is minus 5%. So this is more intuitive. So we lose here $10 over two years and uh, the geometric mean is minus 5%. This makes sense. And then we can also use uh, the geometric mean and uh, calculate uh, the ending value of 90 only with uh, the beginning value of 100. So 100 times one plus uh, the geometric mean to the power of two, and uh, this gives 90. So that's great, but it is even more simple with the log returns. So log returns are additive over time, and uh, that means uh, that we can just add them up over time so for example, we could take uh, the sum over the log returns and this is minus 10%. And then the next step, we can simply pass uh, the sum of log returns to np.x. So we actually calculate e to the power of minus 10% and then here times 100. And also here, this uh, gives uh, the final value of 90. And alternatively, instead of uh, calculating the sum, we can also calculate uh, the mean log return and use uh, the mean log return. So the mean log return is here minus 5%. And then we can pass uh, the mean log return times uh, the number of periods, which is two to np.exp. And also here we can calculate the final value of 90 based uh, on uh, the beginning value of 100. And as you can see, using log returns simplifies uh, things and calculations 
because an addition is simpler than multiplication and uh, getting the arithmetic mean of log returns is simpler than getting the geometric mean of simple returns. So the take home message is here that log returns are additive over time and uh, simple returns are not additive over time, but uh, they can be multiplied or compounded, which is maybe a bit more complicated than just adding log returns up. So time additivity is uh, one favorable characteristic of log returns, but it's not uh, the only reason why it makes sense to work with log returns. And uh, we will see some more benefits uh, here in uh, the next lectures of uh, this section. Thanks for watching and uh, see you there. Bye. All right, let's compare simple and log returns when it comes to calculating the investment multiple, the compound annual growth rate and the normalized prices. So let's first of all import pandas and numpy and uh, Microsoft data from the CSV file Microsoft. And uh, we add another column with uh, the log returns. So this is uh, the data frame with prices, simple returns and log returns. And uh, now let's start with uh, the investment multiple. And of course we can calculate uh, the multiple simply by dividing the last price uh, by the very first price. So we can do that here. But uh, very often and in many workflows and projects, we simply don't have uh, the prices. We just have uh, the returns. So either simple or log returns, but uh, that's uh, not a problem here. So calculating uh, the investment multiple with uh, returns is uh, rather simple. So if we have uh, simple returns, then we can compound the simple returns. So we add one to each and every return and uh, calculate uh, the product. So to say we calculate uh, the compound the returns and here we have the multiple of 5.43 and uh, alternatively if we have log returns then we can uh, sum up uh, the log returns and then pass uh, this uh, to np.exp so e to the power of uh, the sum of uh, the log returns and uh, we could also say here that we use uh, cumulative returns because we simply add uh, the log returns and uh, we get the, the same result, so 5.43. Then next, calculating normalized prices uh, with a base of one is actually the very same operation. It's uh, like determining the current investment multiple at each and every point in time. And uh, if we have uh, simple returns, again, we can compound simple returns. And instead of calculating only one value, the final value, we can you calculate uh, values for each and every timestamp uh, with comprobed. So here the initial value is actually one and uh, then the final value after seven years is 5.43. And likewise, so we can do the same if we have log returns. So instead of calculating the sum, we can calculate uh, the cumulative sum and uh, then we can pass here a panda series to np.exp so this gives, of course, uh, the very same normalized uh, prices with uh, the final price of 5.43. And actually, this is one way how we can do it. So we can pass a panda series uh, to uh, the numpy function np.exp. But uh, in my view, it's a bit more pythonic to actually apply the function np.exp to each and every uh, element of the panda series here. So this is uh, the alternative for uh, this code here and I actually prefer this one here but of course uh, the result is uh, the very same. And finally log returns also allow us to calculate uh, the compound annual growth rate. So we have uh, seen uh, this uh, formula before. This is uh, quite complex and uh, we use uh, the last price divided by the first price and uh, determine the number of years. So this is quite complex and uh, we get here a compound annual growth rate of 28.97%. But alternatively, we can also use uh, the mean of uh, daily log returns. And the only thing that uh, we need to know or need to have is the uh, trading days per year. And uh, we can determine here uh, the trading days uh, per year, so the average trading days per year with the following code. So on average, uh, we have here 200. 51.8 uh, trading days per year. So just as a reminder, Saturdays and Sundays and also bank holidays are not trading days. 
and then uh, we actually have round about 252 trading days at least uh, for us stocks and uh, then we can use uh, the number of trading days per year to calculate uh, the compound annual growth rate just uh, with uh, the mean log return so we have here e to the power of uh, the mean log return times uh, the number of trading days minus one and uh, this gives uh, the correct uh, compound annual growth rate of 28.97 percent and in contrast to that there's uh, no chance uh, to get uh, the correct compound annual growth rate with uh, the mean of simple returns so this doesn't work it's just an approximation and finally very often you will see something like this here so at least for us stocks uh, 252 is a good approximation for the number of trading days in a year and then we can also calculate here the compound annual growth rate so an approximation with uh, the mean log return times uh, 252 and then passed uh, to np.x minus one and uh, this is an approximation a good approximation 29 percent all right this was a very first demonstration why and uh, how we can and should use the log returns instead of simple returns. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lectures. Bye. All right, we have learned that we should better use log returns and now we are best prepared to compare the performance of our six instruments. And uh, there's still the general rule that higher risk must be rewarded with higher returns. And uh, the question is now which instrument performed best and uh, worst in the past in terms of risk and return. So we have seen that uh, Bitcoin had uh, the highest uh, reward or the highest return, but uh, there's also quite high risk involved in uh, investing in Bitcoin. So we should definitely consider risk and return. And uh, now let's start uh, with pandas, numpy, and also matplotlib. And then we import uh, the CSV file close.csv with uh, the close prices for these six instruments. And uh, initially we tried to compare the six instruments by just uh, plotting the absolute prices. And here we have seen that uh, we can't uh, really compare here the instruments. So this was uh, the initial analysis and it's uh, kind of useless here. Now let's go on and let's have a quick look here into some meta information. And uh, we have here missing values and uh, different amounts of missing values for the instruments and uh, this makes it a bit more complicated. So we have here the problem that uh, we have instruments uh, with different trading days. So the Bitcoin is uh, traded more or less uh, seven days a week and uh, 24 hours a day and uh, other instruments like stocks are not traded on weekends and uh, bank holidays and therefore we have here quite a few missing values and uh, these missing values cause uh, quite a lot problems here in uh, further calculations and analysis so now in the next step we want to calculate uh, log returns for all six instruments and uh, we could do the following so we could uh, simply take uh, the complete uh, closed data frame and calculate uh, log returns. But uh, when we have a look here at uh, the info method, then we can see that uh, we create additional missing values. And uh, this is because uh, we already had uh, missing values in uh, the columns. And uh, what we have to do here, we have to calculate uh, the log returns uh, separately for each and every uh, instrument. And uh, we can do the following. So we have the data frame close and then we apply the following lambda function to each and every column. So X stands for each and every column. And then uh, we uh, calculate uh, log returns and we make sure that before we drop uh, missing values from uh, the specific instrument. So we remove uh, missing values before we calculate the log returns. And uh, by chaining the info method as well here, we can see that uh, we get a lot uh, more non-missing values. So we have to select here this uh, a bit more complex code. 
and to create the data frame returns uh, with uh, the log returns for all six instruments. So here we are. And uh, we can see that uh, we have uh, 1,600 uh, values for the stocks and over 2,400 uh, values for Bitcoin. Now, once we have the daily rock returns, we can calculate uh, the mean of returns and uh, the standard deviation of returns. And uh, again, there's a very quick and simple way. We can call the describe method that returns uh, a couple of uh, summary statistics like the mean. So that's uh, the mean return, the mean log return and uh, the standard deviation of returns. And uh, for our purposes here, we are only interested in the mean and the standard deviation as uh, measures uh, for the risk and uh, reward. And uh, therefore we could do the following. So we could use uh, the egg method on the returns data frame and to aggregate uh, with uh, the mean function and uh, the function standard deviation. And uh, by doing so, we create uh, the new data frame summary. So here we have uh, the six instruments and uh, the corresponding mean return and the standard deviation of returns. And it uh, might make sense to transpose uh, this data frame here, so to say, to exchange columns and uh, rows. So we can do this uh, with T. And now we have uh, two columns here. So the mean and uh, the standard deviation for the six instruments. And finally, we shouldn't use the mean and standard deviation uh, with uh, lowercase letters as uh, column headers of a data frame because uh, the data frame has uh, methods like mean and standard deviation. So we should uh, switch here to title case and uh, rename the column headers to mean and uh, standard deviation. So that's just uh, to clean up here the data frame slightly. And uh, now we can perform a mean variance analysis and a comparison of uh, the six instruments. So for example, uh, the big Bitcoin has a higher mean return, but also a higher standard deviation. So higher risk uh, gets uh, rewarded uh, with higher returns. But it's actually best to visualize uh, this so we have two features, uh, the mean and the standard deviation, and therefore we can create a two-dimensional plot with uh, the standard deviation on the x-axis and uh, the mean on the y-axis. So we can create a scatter plot where on the x-axis uh, we have uh, the column standard deviation and on the y-axis uh, the mean. And then we can also add an annotation so we can uh, label uh, the points uh, that we create here in the scatter plot with uh, the respective uh, stock takers. So let's simply create here the plot. Mean variance analysis with uh, the risk on uh, the x-axis and uh, the return on the y-axis, so the mean return. And uh, we can conclude uh, that uh, the general rule holds with uh, one exception. So the rule that higher risk uh, requires higher return so there's almost a perfect uh, curve or straight line here for the instruments uh, euro us dollar gold uh, the dow jones index microsoft and bitcoin and uh, there's only one exception so boeing and uh, we can conclude that uh, boeing underperformed in the past and uh, based on this simple analysis we can also conclude that uh, there's no clear best performer so it's uh, just uh, the general rule, higher risk, higher return, and uh, there's no clear winner here. However, as a side note, we should uh, recall that uh, we ignore here dividend payments for stocks. So these are only price returns uh, without dividend payments, and therefore the true return or the total return of uh, the stocks Microsoft and uh, Boeing are getting slightly underestimated. So actually we would have to add here also the dividends. But uh, for our purposes here, it's uh, fine to ignore dividends here. So this is not an explicit uh, section on uh, stocks. Now, last but not least, uh, there's a take home message. So the mean variance analysis has uh, one major shortcoming here. 
And it actually assumes uh, that financial returns follow a normal distribution, and uh, that's typically not the case. And uh, we will see this in more detail in the next lecture, but uh, the consequences uh, that uh, the standard deviation of returns then underestimates uh, the true or the full risk of an investment as it fails to measure tail risk, so to say extreme outcomes, and uh, in particular extreme negative outcomes. So we know that uh, the Bitcoin has uh, extreme uh, negative uh, outcomes and returns from time to time. So the standard deviation alone is uh, not uh, the best measure for the risk. And therefore the performance in particular of uh, the Bitcoin seems to be better and uh, more favorable here in uh, the mean variance analysis as it uh, actually is in uh, the reality where we also have uh, tail risk events. And again, we will have a closer look into this in the very next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In the last lecture, we ignored dividend payments for the stocks uh, Boeing and Microsoft and also for the Dow Jones Index. So the Dow Jones Index is a price return index and not a total return index. And uh, just to recap, so the total return of a stock is uh, the price return, so the price increase or decrease plus uh, the dividends. And uh, as a good approximation, uh, we can use uh, the adjusted close price for the total return. Now, omitting the dividends is a uh, common practice, but it's not really correct, or to say at least it's not accurate because uh, we have learned before that by omitting dividends, we underestimate uh, the true performance of stocks and in particular the performance of high dividend paying stocks. And now it's uh, the time to work uh, with uh, the adjusted close price as well. So we still have saved uh, the close prices for these six instruments. And uh, now the plan is to get uh, the adjusted close prices uh, for Boeing and uh, for Microsoft. So from multiassets.csv, we select here the adjusted close prices and then we add uh, the adjusted close prices for Boeing and Microsoft to the closed data frame. So let's check here the closed data frame. So here we have now the close prices and also the adjusted close prices for Boeing and uh, for Microsoft. And uh, once again, we can now calculate uh, the returns. So for the uh, close columns, uh, we calculate price returns. And for the adjusted close prices, we calculate total returns. And uh, once again, we can create uh, the summary data frame. And now let's simply plot here the mean variance framework. So the summary data frame. And uh, we actually plot here the points for Microsoft uh, price return and total return and also for Boeing. And uh, we can see here that uh, there's clearly a difference. So the difference is significant and the difference is actually uh, the dividend yield. And actually Microsoft and Boeing pay moderate dividends and uh, this analysis uh, would be even more significant uh, with high dividend paying stocks. And uh, once again, the key message is here that uh, we shouldn't omit dividends when we analyze uh, the performance of stocks. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye. At the end of the last lecture, I said that financial returns typically don't follow a normal distribution. So the mean return and uh, the standard deviation of returns are important, but not sufficient to measure the true performance of financial instruments so the mean variance analysis fails to measure extreme events and extreme outcomes. And therefore we need additional metrics uh, to measure tail risks, so to say uh, extreme outcomes. And uh, that's uh, the high level message or the summary of uh, this lecture here. And uh, now we are going to further analyze and prove this in the next uh, couple of minutes. But uh, before I have to say that uh, there will be a lot of statistics involved here in this lecture and I won't explain all the concepts in detail as uh, for me it's more important uh, that you understand uh, the big picture and uh, the key message. 
However, the good news is that you can find uh, detailed explanations on all these uh, statistical concepts in the appendix of uh, this course. So there you will find uh, 20 or 25 lectures that explain everything that you will see here in uh, this one lecture. So if you are interested in the details, then please go to the appendix. All right, let's start coding and let's import pandas, numpy and also matplotlib. And then we load uh, the Microsoft data frame from the CSV file. So here we have uh, prices and simple returns. And now, first of all, we create the log returns. And uh, then we can get some summary statistics uh, with the scribe. So here we have uh, the two uh, most important metrics, the mean and uh, the standard deviation. And uh, these are summary statistics uh, for our uh, log uh, returns. So in total we have uh, 1,676 log returns. And uh, these are summary statistics here. However, it definitely makes sense uh, to have a closer look at uh, the frequency distribution. So we should uh, visualize here the distribution of outcomes and uh, the best choice how we can visualize a frequency distribution is uh, with a histogram and uh, we can create a histogram with plot and uh, then we pass hist uh, to the kind parameter and then we have to define uh, the number of bins so 100 so we organize here the log returns in 100 bins uh, with equal widths and uh, then we can see uh, the frequency of the bins so let's uh, simply run th the cell here so this is uh, the frequency distribution of log returns and here on the x-axis uh, we see the daily returns and uh, we have some extreme outliers here so on one day we uh, lost more than 15 percent and uh, on another day the positive return was around about 12 or 13 percent and it's no surprise that most of the values are here around uh, zero so this is uh, the frequency distribution with uh, absolute uh, frequencies, but uh, we can also kind of normalize uh, this by passing true to the density parameter. And uh, the effect is now that if we calculate uh, the area here of uh, the blue bars, then uh, we end up uh, with one. So the sum of uh, the blue areas here is one when uh, we uh, pass uh, true to the density parameter. And uh, this allows us uh, to compare here the frequency distribution with a normal distribution that uh, we can create uh, with uh, SciPy. But uh, first of all, so the general question is here that we want to answer, do Microsoft returns follow a normal distribution? And as a quick summary here, so a normally distributed random variable can be fully described by its mean and its standard deviation. So we could also call the Microsoft log returns a random variable because it's uh, the result of a random process. So the returns are generated uh, kind of randomly. And a normally distributed random variable can be fully described by the mean and the standard deviation. So once we know the mean and uh, the standard deviation, we draw a bell-shaped curve. So I do think uh, that you can remember that. So a normal distribution is a bell-shaped curve. And I guess you have seen that before in high school, college or university or whatever. So we only need the mean and the standard deviation and uh, then we can draw the corresponding normal distribution. And uh, this means that for a normal distribution, higher central moments are zero. And uh, the two most important higher central moments are the skew and uh, the kurtosis. So the skew measures uh, the symmetry around the mean. So it checks uh, whether the distribution here is symmetric around uh, the mean value here. And second, uh, we have uh, the excess kurtosis. And if uh, we exhibit positive excess kurtosis, then we have more observations in the tails. So extreme outcomes on the left-hand side or the right-hand side. Now, by definition, a normal distribution can be fully described by the mean and the standard deviation. 
and uh, the skew is uh, zero and also the excess uh, kurtosis. And uh, now let's calculate uh, all four metrics. So mu for the mean, then the standard deviation. And then we can also calculate uh, the skew and the kurtosis uh, with the scipy.stats. And first of all, we need to import it as stats. And then let's calculate uh, the skew. So we select the log returns and make sure that uh, we remove missing values. And now let's have a look. So zero means uh, that uh, it is uh, symmetric. And here we have uh, a slight uh, deviation from zero minus 0 0.2. And uh, this could mean that Microsoft returns are slightly uh, left skewed so that uh, there are more data points here on the left hand side of uh, the mean value. And finally, and even more important, uh, let's uh, calculate uh, the excess kurtosis. So there are two different definitions of uh, the kurtosis and uh, the Fisher kurtosis actually measures uh, the excess kurtosis. So we have to pass here true to Fisher and again, a Fisher kurtosis or an excess kurtosis of uh, zero indicates uh, that uh, the random variable is normal distributed. But uh, here we have a clear deviation from the value zero. So we have a large uh, positive excess kurtosis. And uh, this indicates uh, that uh, Microsoft returns exhibit fat tails. So extreme positive and also negative outcomes. And uh, now we can also compare here our frequency distribution with a corresponding normal distribution. So by using uh, the mean and the standard deviation. And uh, first of all, we can create uh, 10,000 X values in the range between uh, the minimum value and the maximum value with np.lin space. So here we have 10,000 data points between minus 15% and uh, plus uh, 13%. And now we can calculate uh, the corresponding Y values of a normal distribution with uh, the mean and uh, the standard deviation. So we can use stats.norm.pdf and uh, pass uh, mu and uh, sigma and also the X values to calculate uh, the corresponding Y values. So these are the corresponding Y values if uh, we assume a normal distribution. And now we can plot both. So the frequency distribution of Microsoft log returns and uh, the corresponding normal distribution in one graph. And uh, we actually use here density equals true to make it comparable here to uh, the normal distribution in red. And uh, we can clearly see here that uh, the frequency distribution in blue does not really follow a normal distribution. So we have here fat tails, so more observations in uh, the extreme tails, and also more observations here in the middle and uh, less observations here. And also graphically, we can conclude that Microsoft returns exhibit fat tails and uh, finally, we can also perform a hypothesis test and uh, we can test uh, the normality of Microsoft returns based on the sample. So we don't have uh, the full population of Microsoft returns, but only a sample between October 2014 and uh, May 2021. And actually in statistics, uh, we can't uh, really prove anything. So what we can do actually, we can uh, make hypothesis and uh, reject hypothesis or not. And uh, here in our example, the hypothesis is that uh, generally the Microsoft returns, so the full population follow a normal distribution and uh, we can either reject or not reject uh, this hypothesis. And uh, therefore we perform a normal test uh, with the stats.normal test and pass uh, the log returns. And uh, this returns uh, the so-called uh, set statistic and the p-value. So here we have the set statistic of uh, 326, which is uh, really high. So high values for the set statistic indicate uh, that we should reject uh, the null hypothesis. 
and uh, high values actually mean values above uh, 2 or 2.5. So 326 is a very high value for a set statistic. And now we can also calculate uh, the corresponding p-value and uh, low values close to zero indicate uh, that we should reject uh, the null hypothesis. And uh, here we have a very small value. So we have 1.06 times uh, 10 to the power of minus 71. So this is here a scientific notation for a very small number and effectively uh, this is zero and uh, we can also round here the p-value p to uh, 10 digits and it's uh, just uh, zero. Now finally what's uh, the conclusion of our hypothesis test here? So assuming that uh, Microsoft returns uh, generally follow a normal distribution that's uh, the assumption or the hypothesis there's 0% uh, probability or close to 0% probability that we get uh, that extreme outcomes in a sample that we have here. So it's uh, totally unlikely that we get uh, this uh, frequency distribution if uh, we would assume that uh, returns actually follow, do follow a normal distribution and therefore we can reject uh, the null hypothesis and uh, conclude uh, that Microsoft returns do not follow a normal distribution and uh, they exhibit fat tails. So extreme events and extreme outcomes are not reflected in the mean variance analysis and therefore the standard deviation of returns alone underestimates uh, the true risk uh, of our investment here. And uh, with, so thus we have reached uh, the end of uh, this uh, complex lecture. Thanks for watching. And uh, again, if you want to know more, then you can go to the appendix and uh, get more detailed explanations on the concepts uh, covered here. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the appendix or in the next lecture. Bye. All right, in anticipation of the next lecture on resampling and smoothing, in this lecture I would like to explain the concept of annualizing risk and return. So again, we work with pandas, numpy, and matplotlib. And uh, we load the data from uh, Microsoft.csv. Uh, and again, we add uh, another column with uh, the logarithmic returns. And uh, now we can calculate uh, the mean and the standard deviation of log returns as the matrix uh, for the reward and uh, the risk of uh, the investment. So we can do this uh, with uh, the egg method. And then we have here a mean return of 0.1% and a standard deviation of 1.7%. And uh, we should keep in mind uh, that uh, these uh, risk and uh, reward metrics are based on daily data and daily returns. However, many often we have data with different frequency or granularity like 12 hours or two days or weekly or even monthly data. And uh, to compare the performance across different frequencies, we need to annualize uh, metrics like uh, the mean return or the standard deviation of returns. And another advantage is uh, that it's simpler to interpret annualized metrics. So typically investors are used to work with annual returns and annual interest rates. So that's uh, more intuitive. And actually annualizing a risk and reward is uh, pretty simple with log returns as uh, log returns are additive over time. So we can simply multiply the mean log return, so the mean daily log return with uh, 252. So this is an approximation for stocks. So on average, uh, we have 252 trading days in a year. And uh, then we can calculate here the annualized uh, mean return and this is 25.4%. Uh, so this is some more intuitive. So an annual return or an annual interest rate of 25% is uh, more intuitive than a daily mean return of 0.1%. However, you shouldn't mix up uh, the annualized mean return with uh, the compound annual growth rate, but uh, you can ca actually calculate uh, the compound annual growth rate with uh, the annualized mean return. So this is simply e to the power of uh, the n annualized uh, mean return minus one gives 29%. Uh,
And if you like, you can view the annualized return as nominal or stated rate of return. And uh, as uh, we have continuous compounding to calculate uh, the effective rate of return or to say the compound annual growth rate, then you have to calculate E to the power of uh, the stated rate. So this isn't actually anything new here. And uh, now let's continue with uh, annualizing the risk. And we can actually annualize the standard deviation of uh, daily mean returns by multiplying it with uh, the square root of uh, 252. And this gives uh, 27.38. And uh, very often students ask why we use here the square root. But uh, you should recall here that uh, the standard deviation is actually the square root of the variance. So the alternative way how to calculate here the annualized standard deviation is as follows. So we could multiply the variance of uh, the daily returns uh, with 252 gives uh, the annualized variance. And then to calculate uh, the annualized standard deviation, we have to take here the square root. And of course, uh, this gives uh, the very same result. And uh, we will continue here in the next lecture on the resampling and smoothing. Now, as a final remark, mathematically, it's incorrect to multiply simple daily returns with 252. However, this is often done in practice for performance reporting purposes. So I don't want to say it's completely wrong, but at least from a pure mathematical point of view, it's incorrect. However, I've done this multiple times in my career and uh, many others in uh, the industry frequently do this. Since trying to explain senior management why it's uh, more correct to use log returns can be a real pain. So just try it out and have fun. And uh, we will continue in the next lecture on resampling and uh, smoothing. All right, let's move on. And we still have daily prices and the daily returns for Microsoft. So here the first uh, 25 uh, trading days are rows. And uh, we can also create, again, the price chart based on daily data. And uh, we can observe here daily volatility. Now, very often we have uh, weekly or monthly price data instead of daily data. And uh, with pandas, it's really simple to downsample daily data to a lower frequency like monthly. So we can resample to monthly data with the resample method. And uh, we actually select uh, the very last uh, price of a month. So on the last trading day for the month. So let's uh, create the data frame monthly. And uh, for example, here for October, we have uh, the last price on uh, the 31st of October, 46.95. And let's uh, double check this. So we have here on the very last day, 46.95, and uh, this is uh, the data point for October. So instead of having over 1,600 daily data points, now we only have 80 data points uh, with monthly data. And now we can also create a monthly price chart. And uh, this uh, looks uh, kind of smooth here. So there's obviously less volatility than before in uh, the daily price chart. And uh, that's uh, the effect of resampling. So effectively we smooth uh, the data. And uh, now this is a very good question. How will the mean variance analysis change uh, with uh, smooth data? And uh, for example, we could consider and compare the following uh, frequencies, so daily, then weekly with the last price on Fridays, monthly, quarterly, and annual. And uh, we have in one year 252 days, 52 weeks, 12 months, four quarters, and uh, one year. And the plan is now to resample Microsoft price data to daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annual and uh, then to calculate uh, the mean return and the standard deviation of returns and annualizing uh, those uh, mean returns and the standard deviation of returns. So for i in range five, so we iterate here over all elements. And then first of all, we resample and then uh, we calculate the log returns. 
and annualize uh, the log returns and uh, the same we do with uh, the standard deviation and uh, we append uh, the annualized mean returns to the list mean return and uh, the annualized the standard deviation of returns to the list annualized standard deviation. So let's first of all define here frequencies, periods and so on and now let's run here the for loop and uh, now we have a list with uh, the annualized means and uh, also a list with uh, the annualized standard deviations and it's best to create here a data frame. So we have here on the left hand side uh, the underlying frequency and here the annualized standard deviation and the annualized mean. And essentially the annualized mean is independent from the selected frequency. So there are minor differences coming from the resampling process. But in theory, uh, the annualized mean should be identical. But now if we uh, consider here the annualized standard deviation, then we can see here a clear trend. So the risk is decreasing once uh, we reduce here uh, the frequency or the granularity. So the risk based on daily data is 26%. Then with weekly data, we have 23%. And uh, finally, if we consider annual data, we are left uh, with a risk of only 12%. And also here we could uh, visualize uh, this in a scatter plot where we have on the x-axis the risk and on the y-axis uh, the return and uh, the frequency or the granularity of the data has actually no impact on uh, the annualized mean return but uh, it has an effect on uh, the risk. So if we downsample or smoothen the data then uh, we can reduce uh, the risk here. However, this is just an illusion. So smoothing reduces uh, the observed risk, but uh, the true or actual risk is uh, still there. So this is just a trick. And uh, this leads uh, to dubious practices. And I've listed here three of them. And uh, first of all, with uh, smoothing, one uh, could uh, manage or more exact manipulate uh, the performance and performance reportings. So if you want to reduce uh, the calculated risk, then you should work with uh, weekly or monthly price data instead of daily data. But uh, this is obviously a dubious practice. Next, some investors argue that they work with uh, monthly stock price data because uh, their average holding period or investment period is uh, several months or even years. And uh, this is not completely wrong, but it's also not best practice. So the volatility is uh, still there and uh, you can hide it, but it's still there. And uh, in the end, uh, best practice is uh, to be as uh, reasonable as possible. So day traders uh, should work with uh, minutely or five second data or even lower. And uh, long term investors uh, should try to work with daily or maybe weekly data. But in my view, monthly or quarterly is inappropriate, but uh, that's maybe also a matter of taste. And uh, finally, comparing assets uh, with different pricing frequency and uh, different pricing mechanisms is uh, not uh, really meaningful and useful. And as an example, comparing real estate uh, where we have quarterly expert valuations with uh, listed stocks where we can observe real prices in real time doesn't really make sense because we have two problems here. So number one, expert valuations are not realized prices. So it's better to work with uh, realized prices because valuations are typically less volatile. And second, uh, comparing quarterly prices with uh, minutely, hourly or daily prices is nonsense in any case. So we have uh, seen that before. But uh, nevertheless, many real estate investment firms claim that uh, real estate is a low risk investment with a great uh, risk return profile. But uh, you should be careful here. So very often they use uh, quarterly or even annual valuations uh, to support uh, their claims. And therefore the take home message of uh, this lecture is, so when comparing instruments and uh, the performance of instruments, the frequency of uh, the underlying data must be the same. So don't compare apples and oranges. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye.
We are coming now to another important workflow, calculating rolling statistics. And uh, these rolling statistics can help us to analyze and prove another fundamental rule in finance and investing. So the past performance is not uh, the best indicator of future performance. It's uh, one aspect and uh, we should take into account the past performance when uh, trying to forecast the future performance, but it's only one aspect and uh, we can't simply assume that an instrument or a strategy that uh, has generated high profits in the past will continue to do so in the future. So we still have saved uh, the Microsoft data frame and uh, here we have uh, prices and log returns uh, for the seven years period from 2014 till 221. And then actually we can calculate annualized uh, mean return. So the annualized mean return over the full seven years period and uh, this is 25.4%. Uh, and likewise, so we can calculate uh, the annualized, the standard deviation of returns, so the annualized risk. So these uh, performance metrics are actually based on a seven years period, which is actually a too long time period to just aggregate and uh, report the performance uh, over the full period. So technologies and uh, the business environment and uh, competition can rapidly change, in particular in the IT business. And uh, taking into account uh, the performance seven years ago could uh, be inappropriate here. So first of all, let's check whether the return and the risk are constant over time. And uh, we could uh, suspect uh, that uh, this is not the case. So return and risk change over time and uh, we can measure and quantify this uh, with uh, rolling statistics. And uh, rolling statistics require a rolling window. So for example, the most recent 252 trading days, which is uh, equivalent uh, to one calendar year. So let's save 252 in uh, the variable window. And uh, a rolling statistic uh, with uh, rolling window 252 means that on each and every trading day, we only take into account uh, the most recent 252 days to actually calculate uh, the statistics like the mean return or the standard deviation of returns. So whenever we move one day forward, we add uh, the most recent day and we drop uh, the least uh, recent day that is now lying more than one year in the past. And uh, we can actually do this uh, with uh, the method rolling so we select uh, the log returns and uh, then uh, we chain the rolling method and uh, this provides uh, rolling window calculations. And uh, the most important parameter is the window parameter. So we could uh, pass here 252 or the variable window. And uh, this returns a pandas rolling object and uh, we have to chain now an aggregation method so calculating summary statistics and uh, one option would be uh, to actually chain the sum method. So we sum up uh, the returns of uh, the last 252 days and uh, by doing so we actually calculate uh, the annualized uh, return or the annualized mean return. So let's uh, run the cell here and uh, that's uh, the first alternative and uh, there's also a second alternative. So we can uh, chain the mean method and calculate uh, the rolling mean. And uh, then we can annualize uh, the rolling mean by multiplying it uh, with 252. So let's calculate uh, the rolling mean returns. And uh, initially we have uh, 252 missing values. And uh, we can also further check this and uh, start uh, with uh, the 251st uh, element. So in total we have 252 missing values and uh, the reason is pretty simple. So in the first 252 days we don't have enough data to actually calculate uh, the rolling mean for the most recent 252 days and therefore we have here in the first 252 days missing values for the rolling mean. And then here on the 1st of October 2015 uh, we have uh, the first rolling mean and uh, this aggregates uh, the returns of uh, the most recent 252 days. Now we can also plot uh, the rolling mean. 
And actually, we have seen before that uh, the rolling mean return over the entire seven years period is uh, 25.4%. So it's here. But uh, we can clearly see here that uh, the mean return is not stable over time. So it's kind of oscillating here around uh, the mean of 25.4%. So that's uh, the rolling mean return with a window of 252 days. And uh, now likewise, we can also calculate uh, the rolling standard deviation. And uh, also here we make sure that uh, we annualize uh, the rolling standard deviation. And also here we start with 252 missing values. And uh, let's also plot here the rolling risk. So the annualized standard deviation over the entire seven years period is 27.3 percent but uh, also the risk changes over time so here's uh, the mean for the entire period but uh, we have sub periods where the risk is lower and also higher and finally we can also plot uh, the rolling mean return and uh, the rolling standard deviation of returns in one plot so here in blue we have the rolling mean return and in green the rolling standard deviation of returns. And it's uh, pretty obvious uh, that uh, we can find sub-periods where uh, the return is high and uh, the risk is low. But also we can find sub-periods uh, where the risk is high and uh, the return is low. And therefore this is another way to trick or to manipulate uh, the performance of an instrument. And uh, when selecting the right time period, uh, we should be careful because uh, we will always find sub-periods uh, with low returns and high risk and uh, vice versa. And therefore, the analysis period uh, must be sufficiently long to reduce uh, the impact of random noise. But at uh, the same time, uh, the period should be as short as possible. And uh, we should only include uh, the latest trends or regimes. So regime changes is uh, the buzzword here and uh, this is highly case specific and it includes uh, significant structural changes in the society, technology, economy, politics and also with uh, regard uh, to competition and more. And uh, obviously there's a trade-off between uh, those two aspects here and uh, we should find uh, the right analysis period and uh, commonly used the reporting periods are three years or 36 months but uh, you can also see one year or also five years to actually compare the performance of instruments and uh, finally simple moving averages is another application in particular for technical analysis so several technical indicators are required to calculate the moving average prices and uh, for example, we could calculate the moving average price from Microsoft in the last or the most recent 50 days. And uh, let's say here 50 in the variable SMA window. And then we can actually uh, use the rolling on the price and uh, we actually select a rolling window of 50. And then we calculate uh, the mean rolling price and plot the price over time. And here in blue we have the price and in green uh, the simple moving average 50. And uh, this is actually also another method uh, to smooth the prices and price charts. And with this we have reached uh, the end of uh, this video. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next one. Bye. Short selling or in other words taking short positions in an instrument is a very important and very useful feature for any trader and a speculative investor. And uh, the most important question is what's uh, the rationale behind short selling? So why do traders and investors uh, short sell instruments? And uh, the answer is pretty simple. So short selling allows traders and investors to make profits, so to say positive returns when prices fall. And uh, now let's have a look at a simple example, a stocks example. And uh, before we take a closer look at the uh, short positions, let's start uh, with uh, the normal case. So taking a long position and uh, let's assume that uh, today an investor buys uh, the ABC stock for $100 
And then one day later, he sells uh, the stock for $110. So the price arises from $100 to $110. And uh, the profit is $10. And uh, we could also say that uh, the investor benefits from rising prices because uh, he had a long position in the stock. So this is uh, the long position. And uh, now let's uh, further analyze uh, the short position or short selling a stock. So let's assume that uh, today an investor borrows uh, the ABC stock from another investor. So he borrows uh, the stock and at some future point in time, he has to give uh, the stock back uh, to the lender. But uh, before that, uh, the investor sells uh, the borrowed stock for a price, for example, of $100. And then let's assume that one day later, the price falls to $90, then it definitely makes sense to actually buy the stock back in the market for $90 and then to return uh, the borrowed stock to the lender. And with uh, these transactions, uh, the investor generates a profit of $10 before borrowing fees. So we ignore here borrowing fees. But uh, without borrowing fees, he makes a profit of $10. And uh, therefore, we could also say that uh, he was benefiting from falling prices because he took a short position in the stock by short selling the stock. Now in some countries and for some instruments like stocks, short selling is uh, prohibited and uh, the most intuitive or most popular use case for short selling is the uh, currencies or foreign exchange. So it's uh, pretty intuitive that uh, we can go both ways so we can use the uh, euro to buy dollar and uh, we can use dollar to buy euro. So that's, uh, so to say, the inverse transactions. And also for cryptocurrencies, uh, this is uh, very intuitive. So we can uh, use dollar to buy Bitcoin or we can use Bitcoin uh, to buy dollar. And uh, now let's have a short excursus and let's have a closer look at the foreign exchange and uh, currencies. Hi, I'm here on Oanda.com, a popular broker for Forex and uh, CFD trading. And on this website, we can find some more information on currencies and uh, Forex trading and uh, trading in general. And uh, for example, here in uh, the getting started section, we can get more details on fundamental trading terms like bid and ask prices, spreads, pip and more. And uh, for example, here we have uh, the instrument uh, Euro US dollar, that's a currency pair. And maybe it's important to notice here that uh, no matter if you trade uh, stocks, currencies, commodities, or whatever concepts like uh, bid and ask prices, spreads, or also long and short positions are always uh, the same. So as an example, let's consider here the currency pair Euro US dollar. And actually currency pairs on Oanda are always listed in the same order. So there's only the pair Euro US dollar and not the pair US dollar Euro. But of course you can trade in both directions. And actually the convention is uh, that uh, the first currency is uh, the base currency, it's uh, the Euro. And uh, the second currency is uh, the quote currency, uh, so the US dollar. And uh, then the exchange rate indicates how much of uh, the quote currency, so how much uh, US dollar we have to pay to actually get uh, one euro. Or if we sell euro, how many US dollars uh, we get uh, for one euro. So now example here, if uh, we buy one euro, then we have to pay 1.05772 dollar. And if you want to sell one euro, then we get here 1.05761 US dollar. So in total, we have here two different prices. And depending on whether we want to buy euro or sell euro, then one of those two prices apply. And the rule is actually pretty simple. We always get the less favorable price. So if you want to buy euro, then uh, the higher price applies. So we have to pay more for one euro. And uh, whenever we want to sell euro, then we get um, the lower price. So again, in our example here, if you want to buy one euro, we have to pay 1.0577. And if we sell one euro, then we only get 1.0576.
And actually the buy price is also called uh, the ask price and uh, the sell price is uh, the bid price. Now, as you can see, there's a difference between ask price and bid price. And uh, that's also called here the spread. And uh, the spread is actually uh, the profit uh, that uh, the broker, so Oanda, makes here in a trade. And Oanda actually contracts uh, with uh, both parties, so parties who sell the euro and uh, buy the euro. And uh, the profit is uh, the spread here. And typically the spread is uh, displayed in so-called pips. In our example, uh, the difference is here 1.1 pip. And as a general rule, the fourth uh, decimal place is one pip. So we have here the first decimal place, the second, the third, and uh, the fourth. And Oanda provides also a fifth uh, decimal place, but uh, the fourth is actually one pip. And actually price changes or price moves and also differences uh, between exchange rates is uh, measured in pips. And in our example, it's here 1.1 pip. So the bid ask spread in our example is 1.1 pip and uh, that's actually the profit of the broker. And uh, from our perspective as investor, this is actually costs or trading costs. And uh, the higher the spread, uh, the higher the costs of the transaction and uh, the lower the efficiency of our transaction. So in day trading, it's uh, more likely to make profits when the spreads are low. All right, let's scroll further down here. So we have here a description of currency pairs and base and quote currency. Then we have uh, the spread here. We have bid prices and ask, ask prices. And also here we can see what is a pip. Now the question is why are Forex uh, trades uh, so popular? And uh, first of all, the Forex market is uh, the largest and the most uh, liquid market. And as a direct consequence, whenever liquidity is high, then uh, spreads and uh, transaction costs are low, which is uh, good for us. And finally, currency exchange rates are typically more volatile than uh, stock indices. And uh, to make some profit, uh, then it's uh, good if we have some volatility in the prices. Now, the most important question is how can we make money with the Forex trades? And uh, the basic idea is uh, that a currency appreciates either or depreciates in relation to another currency. And uh, appreciation means increase in value and depreciation decrease in value. So let's have a look at an example. We have our currency pair Euro US dollar and uh, there are two scenarios. So either we expect that the euro appreciates uh, relative uh, to US dollar, so it increases in value and uh, so to say the US dollar decreases in value. And in this case, we should actually buy euro and uh, click here on the ask price or the ask side. And in contrast to that, uh, we have scenario two. So we expect uh, that the euro will depreciate relatively to the US dollar. And in this case, uh, we should uh, sell Euro. Finally, let's have a look at some more vocabulary. And in Forex trading, there are a couple of terms uh, that actually mean the very same thing. And also we will use uh, those terms interchangeably. So if we expect the Euro to appreciate in value relatively to the US dollar, we should buy Euro. And uh, interchangeably, we can also say that uh, we should take a long position in the euro or that we should sell US dollar or take a short position in the US dollar. And if we expect uh, the euro to depreciate uh, against uh, the US dollar, then uh, we should sell euro or take a short position in the euro or buy US dollar or take a long position in uh, the US dollar. Finally, no matter which position we have, we shouldn't forget to uh, close position at some point in time. And uh, we can do this uh, with uh, the reverse transaction. So initially, if we buy 1000 euro here, then at some point in time, we should close uh, the position by selling 1000 euro. All right, this was a short introduction into Forex and trading. Thanks for watching and see you in the next lectures. Bye.
All right, let's continue with short selling and short positions. And uh, we have uh, the currency pair Euro, US dollar. And in uh, this notation, the Euro is uh, the base currency and the US dollar is uh, the quote currency. And now let's assume that today's price is 1.1. So we have to pay 1.1 dollar to get uh, one Euro. And uh, then tomorrow's price is 1.25. So the price for the euro increases and uh, we can benefit from that uh, with a long position in the euro. So the long position in the euro is equivalent to a short position in the US dollar. And uh, then we have uh, the following transactions here. So today an investor buys one euro and he pays 1.1 dollar. And uh, one day later he sells uh, the euro for 1.25 dollar. And uh, the profit is uh, 15 cents. So we benefit from rising euro prices uh, with a long position in the euro or a short position in the US dollar. And like for any other instrument, we can calculate the simple return of uh, this transaction. So with uh, today's price divided by yesterday's price minus one. But first of all, let's uh, create here the variables. And uh, let's calculate uh, the simple return for this uh, long transaction. And uh, the simple return is plus 13.63%. Uh, uh, and uh, we could also say that uh, the euro appreciates by 13.64% relative uh, to the US dollar. So that's uh, the simple return. Now coming to a question uh, that seems to be a no-brainer. So what return would you expect for the corresponding euro short position so i do think that uh, more than 90 percent of uh, you would say that it's minus 13.64 uh, percent and uh, that's uh, definitely uh, the intuitive answer here so if uh, the euro appreciates by 13.64 percent relative to us dollar then at the, the same time it uh, seems to be equivalent uh, that we say that uh, the dollar depreciates by minus 13.64% uh, relative uh, to the euro. So that's uh, the most intuitive answer, but surprisingly uh, this is incorrect. And uh, to calculate uh, the return of uh, the short position, first of all we have to convert uh, the price or uh, the interest rate to the inverse rate, so to the US dollar euro rate where uh, the euro is short and uh, the dollar is long. And uh, we can simply do this uh, with the one divided by. So we have here actually the same prices, but now we have today uh, 0.91 euro to buy one dollar. And tomorrow it's only 0.8 euro to buy one dollar. And uh, this leads to the following transactions. So today an investor buys one dollar and he pays 0.91 euro. And uh, one day later he sells uh, the dollar for 0.8 euro. And uh, the total loss is here around about 11 euro cents. And also for this short transaction we can calculate uh, the simple return. So T1 divided by T0 minus 1. And uh, surprisingly, this is not minus 13.64%, uh, but uh, minus 12%. Uh, so we could also say that uh, the US dollar depreciates by 12% relative uh, to the euro. And uh, this is equivalent uh, to uh, the other statement that uh, the euro appreciates by plus 13.64%. So this is, uh, or this could be kind of a surprise for you. And uh, the take home message is that uh, when using simple returns, the long position return is unequal to the short position return times minus one. So these are not the same. And uh, there's also a solution. And also here, no surprise, the log returns are more appropriate when working with short positions. And uh, we will see this in more detail in the next lecture. Thanks for watching and see you there. Bye. In the last lecture we have seen that uh, the simple return of a long position is not equal to uh, the negative simple return of uh, the corresponding short position. And uh, now let's double check this with uh, real data. 
and uh, we import na pandas, numpy, and also matplotlib, and uh, we get uh, the close prices uh, for our six instruments. And uh, here we have a euro, US dollar, and uh, now we add uh, the inverse actually, so US dollar, euro. And uh, then we are only interested in the two forex columns, so we select uh, euro, US dollar, and uh, US dollar, euro and uh, save uh, those two columns in uh, the data frame fx. And then we can create a price chart with uh, the absolute prices. And it's no surprise uh, that uh, both move in uh, the opposite directions. So to say they are perfectly and negatively correlated. But also here it's best to have normalized prices that uh, start at uh, the very same base value, for example, one and uh, now, first of all, let's calculate uh, the simple returns. And uh, now from a euro perspective, these are the long position returns and uh, these are the short position returns. And it uh, gets clear that uh, the simple return of a long position is not equal to the negative simple return of the corresponding short position. So for example, here or here or here, so it's not equal and uh, we can also compound uh, those simple returns. And uh, over time uh, with uh, the long position, we actually lose the uh, 3.47% and uh, with uh, the short position, we uh, gain 3.59%. Uh, and of course, we can also calculate uh, the final multiple. So also here it's getting clear that for simple returns, the long position returns are not equal to the short position returns times minus one. And uh, now let's have a look at log returns. And uh, with log returns, we have that uh, very favorable characteristic. So the log return of a long position is uh, equal to the negative log return of the corresponding short position. So you can see this here. And also if we calculate uh, the cumulative log returns uh, with uh, the sum method, then we can see that uh, the long position in Euro returns over the full time period minus the 3.5322% and uh, the short position returns plus 3.5322%. So the long position returns are equal to the short position returns times minus one. And finally, we, now we can also create normalized prices uh, with uh, the log returns. So this is nothing new. We calculate uh, the cumulative sum and uh, apply np.exp. And then at uh, the very first timestamp, uh, we have missing values and uh, we could fill them with uh, the initial value one. So these are the normalized prices starting at one and uh, the long position ends up at a multiple of 0.96 and uh, the short position ends up at 1.03. And finally, we can also visualize this and uh, compare long and short position. So here in green, we have uh, the short position in the euro and in blue, we have uh, the long position. And uh, also here, it's no surprise uh, that uh, they move in the opposite direction. So they are perfectly negatively correlated. And uh, so this we have reached uh, the end of this lecture. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next one. Bye. In the last lecture, we have seen that long and short position move in the opposite direction. And that's of course not a surprise. So whenever there's a profit in the long position, we lose money in the short position and vice versa. And uh, I stated uh, that the long and short positions are perfectly negatively correlated. So let's uh, further elaborate on this. And uh, we want to answer the following questions. So do our six instruments uh, move together or not? And uh, to what extent? So we also want to measure the covariance and uh, the correlation. And uh, generally there are three cases. So either two assets or instruments are unrelated and then there's no relationship or correlation. Then second, uh, the two assets move together and uh, this is also called a positive relationship or correlation. And third, and uh, we have seen this here with the long and short positions, two uh, instruments or assets move in the opposite direction 
and uh, this is also called negative relationship or negative correlation and uh, correlation between instruments and assets play an important role in portfolio management so this is an important topic actually and uh, now let's start here coding and uh, we use the pandas numpy and also matplotlib and uh, we import uh, the close prices uh, from uh, close.csv and uh, we also add a third instrument so it's uh, the short position for euro us dollar so us dollar euro for demonstration purposes so we know that uh, these two instruments are perfectly negatively correlated and then we also create uh, the returns data frame with the uh, log returns so this is nothing new and then generally we have uh, two metrics uh, that allow us uh, to measure if and uh, to what extent uh, two instruments uh, move together or not so it's uh, the covariance and uh, the correlation coefficient and uh, the covariance is actually hard to interpret so therefore typically we use uh, the correlation coefficient but uh, for the sake of completeness so let's uh, create the covariance uh, matrix here with uh, the method cove and uh, this is uh, the matrix because here we can see the pairwise covariance. So for each and every pair, we have here the covariance. And uh, these are very small numbers here, obviously, because uh, this is uh, the covariance based on daily returns. And uh, now let's also create uh, the correlation matrix. So the correlation coefficient is uh, pretty easy to interpret. So let's have a look. And here we have the pairwise the correlation coefficient. And uh, let's again have a look at uh, the three cases. So either we have no correlation and uh, then uh, the correlation coefficient is equal to or close to zero. And as an example, here we have uh, Euro US dollar and uh, Bitcoin US dollar. And here we have a slightly negative uh, correlation of uh, 0.01. So this is very close to zero and uh, we could conclude uh, that uh, there's no relationship between uh, those two assets. Second, uh, two instruments move together if uh, the correlation coefficient is uh, greater than zero and uh, it is actually bound between a zero and plus one. So plus one is a perfect positive correlation and it's uh, actually no surprise uh, that an instrument is uh, with itself uh, perfectly positively correlated. So Boeing with Boeing, Bitcoin with Bitcoin and so on. And third, we have a negative correlation. So negatively correlated instruments have values between uh, minus one and uh, zero. So minus one means a perfect negative correlation. And uh, we should find a perfect negative correlation between long and short position of uh, euro US dollar. And uh, this is uh, the case here, minus one. And as always, it's uh, just best uh, to visualize uh, this. And here in this case, uh, we create a Seaborn heat map. So we use uh, the Seaborn library and uh, we import the Seaborn as SNS. And then we create a Seaborn heat map with uh, the correlation matrix and uh, we scale here the colors between uh, minus one and one so this makes sense so let's have a look so this is uh, the seaborn heat map and uh, we have values between one and minus one and uh, one is uh, dark red and minus one dark blue and it's no surprise uh, that we have dark red here in the diagonal so an instrument is uh, perfectly positively correlated uh, with itself and uh, here we have uh, the perfect negative correlation between US dollar euro and euro US dollar and here in light uh, yellow we can see correlations uh, close to zero so for example between euro US dollar and bitcoin and finally let's search for higher correlations so let's start with Boeing and uh, there's a quite high positive correlation between Boeing and Microsoft so both are large US stocks and uh, we could also say that uh, these two belong to the very same asset class so large US stocks and 
uh, there's an even higher correlation between Boeing and uh, the Dow Jones index and that's no surprise because uh, the Dow Jones index uh, includes 30 large US stocks. So there's a high correlation between Boeing and uh, Dow Jones and also between Microsoft and uh, the Dow Jones index. And uh, there's a rather low correlation between different asset classes. So for example, between uh, the Dow Jones index and Bitcoin or there's uh, close to zero correlation between Dow Jones and uh, Euro US dollar and uh, Dow Jones and gold. And uh, this is also here the take home message. So similar assets are highly positively correlated and uh, different assets typically exhibit low, no or even negative correlation. And uh, in portfolio management, it's beneficial to have assets uh, with low, no or even negative correlation. And uh, that's uh, the so-called portfolio diversification effect. And uh, with this, we have reached uh, the end of this lecture. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next one. Bye. All right, this is a basic and simple introduction to portfolios and portfolio returns. It's basic, but it shows one of the major drawbacks of log returns. So if uh, you get uh, the key message of this lecture, then you will never make the mistake that many others uh, frequently make. So we need uh, pandas and numpy. And then we create a very simple data frame with uh, prices for two instruments or assets. So we have asset A and uh, asset B. And uh, initially both have uh, the price 100. And after one year, asset A, so asset A's price is at 112 and asset B increases to 104. And uh, now let's assume that uh, we have a portfolio with uh, one unit of asset A and uh, one unit of asset B, then we can actually calculate uh, the total value or the total price of uh, the portfolio by simply adding asset A and asset B so this is uh, the total price or the total value of uh, the portfolio. Initially we have 200 and then after one year we have uh, 216. And uh, we can also calculate here the simple returns separately for the assets and also for the total portfolio. And uh, we save uh, this data frame in the variable returns. So asset A returns 12%, asset B 4%, and uh, the total portfolio 8%. And intuitively, this is uh, not a surprise. And uh, alternatively, we can also calculate uh, the portfolio return of 8% only with uh, the uh, returns of uh, the two constituents. So we can calculate uh, the weighted average of simple returns. And uh, we have a weight of 50-50. So initially we have 50% asset A and 50% asset B. And then we can uh, make uh, the following calculation. So 50% times 12% plus 50% times 4% gives 8%, no surprise. And uh, this is uh, the general rule. So the portfolio return is equal to the weighted average of simple returns. And uh, now let's do the very same calculation with log returns. So for asset A, we have a log return of 11.3. For asset B, a log return of 3.9. And uh, the portfolio return is 7.6%. And also here, the initial weights are 50-50. And uh, now if we calculate uh, the weighted average of log returns, then we get here 7.627%, uh, which is uh, different than uh, the actual uh, log uh, portfolio return. And uh, therefore the calculation is uh, incorrect. And uh, we can conclude that uh, the portfolio return, so the portfolio log return is not equal to the weighted average of log returns. And uh, this is uh, the take home message here. So while log returns are time additive, so additive over time, they are not asset additive. And for simple returns, it's the contrary. So while simple returns are not time additive, so they can be compounded, but uh, they are not time additive, they are asset additive. And therefore, when working with uh, constituent returns and portfolio returns, 
So we should uh, rather work with simple returns here. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lecture. Bye. In day trading and speculative investing, margin trading, or in other words, trading with leverage is a hot topic. However, also here there are some pitfalls and uh, frequently made mistakes that uh, you should definitely avoid. So this is a basic introduction to that topic but with uh, very important findings here. And uh, let's start uh, with uh, the definition of mar margin trading taken from investopedia.com. So margin trading refers to the practice of uh, using borrowed funds from a broker to trade a financial asset, which forms uh, the collateral for the loan from the broker. And in uh, simple words, investors don't pay the full price but uh, they get uh, the full benefit of uh, the investments, less borrowing costs. And uh, it's actually a two-edged uh, sword. So leverage amplifies both gains and uh, losses. And uh, in the event of a loss, the collateral is getting reduced. And at uh, some point in time, when uh, the collateral gets smaller, then either the investor posts additional margin, so he pays uh, another money, into the margin account or the broker closes uh, the position and uh, sells uh, the asset and uh, actually repays uh, the borrowed funds. So there's uh, more or less uh, zero risk for the broker and uh, the investor assumes uh, the full risk but also the full chance. And uh, let's have a look at an example. So a trader buys a stock at a stock price of 100 on the margin so the margin is 50% and uh, the investor only pays uh, 50 and then he borrows uh, the other 50 from uh, the broker and after one day the price increases to 110. So the profit is uh, obviously 10 and uh, now we should calculate uh, the unlevered return and also the levered return. So we have uh, the initial price 100 and then the price after one day 110 and uh, we can either say that uh, the margin is 50% or the leverage is 2. So to say the purchase price is 2 times higher than uh, the required margin. And uh, we actually only deposit uh, 100 divided by the leverage, so 50. So effectively we only pay 50. That's uh, the margin. And first of all let's calculate uh, the unlevered return. And uh, we start with uh, the simple return. So uh, the unlevered simple return is simply 100 minus 100. That's uh, the profit 10 divided uh, by the initial price 100 gives uh, an unlevered return of 10%. And uh, then the levered return, simple return, is uh, then the profit of 10 divided uh, by the margin 50. So we only invest 50. And uh, with uh, this investment, uh, we generate a profit of 10, which gives a levered return of 20%. And uh, we can conclude here that uh, the levered return is equal to the unlevered return times uh, the leverage. So 20% is equal to 10% times 2. And uh, this uh, relationship is true for simple returns. And uh, now let's also check this uh, with log returns. So the unlevered log return is uh, the following. So we have here 9.53% and uh, the levered log return is 18.23%. And again, we can check uh, whether the levered return is uh, the unlevered return times uh, the leverage of two. And uh, this is untrue. So two times 9.5% uh, gives around about 19%. So there's uh, a significant difference between uh, the unlevered return times the leverage and uh, the levered return. So this uh, relationship does not hold for log returns. And therefore the take home message is here that uh, when we want to calculate levered returns, we shouldn't multiply the leverage with log returns, but rather with uh, simple returns. So this is another disadvantage of log returns. It's not uh, asset additive and also we can't uh, use uh, them for levered returns. 
So this was a very first introduction into uh, this topic here. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next lectures. Okay. All right, let's build on the previous lecture and let's see uh, leverage live in action with real data, for example, the Microsoft stock. And intuitively, we could assume that uh, the more leverage, uh, the better for highly profitable inve investments like Microsoft. And at uh, the end of this lecture, we will either prove or reject uh, this hypothesis. So let's import pandas, numpy, and also matplotlib. And uh, we also import uh, the Microsoft uh, CSV file and uh, we create a data frame. And uh, here in this data frame, we can find uh, the prices and uh, the log returns. And uh, we have learned before that uh, when working with leverage, uh, we should definitely use simple returns uh, rather than log returns. And therefore, we create here an additional column, simple returns uh, with uh, percentage change. And then let's start with a leverage of two, which is uh, equivalent uh, to a margin of 50%. And uh, we use uh, the following simplified assumptions. So we assume that uh, we restore the leverage on a daily basis. So at uh, the end of the day, we actually uh, buy or sell shares in a way that uh, we restore the leverage of two. And then we also assume that uh, we have no trading costs and uh, no borrowing costs. So these are of course simplified and unrealistic assumptions but uh, this makes uh, life easier for us here in this analysis and uh, we can just uh, focus on our actual topic, so the impact of leverage. And with uh, these assumptions, we can simply calculate uh, the levered returns. So we multiply each and every simple return with the leverage and uh, by doing so, we create uh, an additional column levered simple returns here on the right. And it's no surprise uh, that uh, here we amplify negative and also positive returns. So here we double negative returns and uh, here we double positive returns. Now let's uh, move on. And uh, first of all, let's have a look at uh, the normalized uh, prices with a base value of one. So we have uh, the unlevered returns and uh, the levered returns. So we add one and uh, calculate actually uh, the compound uh, returns. So normalize to a base value of one. And uh, we can clearly see that uh, by investing in uh, the Microsoft stock with a leverage of two, we can turn one dollar here into around about $18. And uh, that's uh, way better than uh, the unlevered alternative. So here we can turn one dollar into uh, around about five or six dollar. So leverage clearly improves here the return metrics, but also we can see that uh, we have here way higher volatility and risk, for example, here and everywhere actually. So we have a higher return, but also a higher risk. And uh, we can also have a look at uh, the extreme cases. So let's search uh, the highest uh, daily return the highest daily uh, simple return, 14.21%. And it's no surprise that the highest levered return is uh, two times uh, the highest unlevered return, 28.4%. And uh, the same we can also do for the lowest returns. So the worst case, so the lowest uh, daily return was minus 14.7% and uh, with uh, a leverage of two, it's 29.4%. Uh, now the question is uh, what happens when uh, the leverage is greater than one divided by uh, the worst case here. So one bit divided by 14.7%. So if the leverage is greater than 6.78%, then mathematically the uh, lowest uh, levered return is uh, lower than minus one. And uh, this means uh, that we lose more than our initial margin. And uh, we can double check this by passing here, for example, seven to leverage. And then we recalculate the levered returns. And uh, we again visualize levered versus unlevered. And here you can clearly see 
that on that day here we lose more than 100% and uh, the multiple slips here below zero. So it uh, goes negative. And here you can clearly see that it's better to invest unlevered rather than with a leverage of a seven or more. And also we can double check this here. So the lowest unlevered simple return is still minus 14.7, but now the levered return with a leverage of seven, the worst levered return is uh, less than minus 100%. And therefore we can conclude that uh, with the leverage, uh, we can theoretically lose more than the initial margin. However, in practice, uh, this is pretty unlikely as uh, we have uh, the mechanisms of a margin call and uh, margin closeout before. So if uh, you invest on margin and borrow funds from a broker, the broker will send a margin call way before the margin account is eaten up by the losses. So a margin call means uh, that uh, the trader need to post additional margin as an additional collateral. And in case uh, the trader doesn't post more money, then the broker will close the position and sell the instrument before the margin turns negative. And uh, this is also called margin closeout. And uh, typically a margin closeout is at 50% uh, of uh, the initial margin. So this is a typical value in practice. But uh, now for our analysis, we can assume that uh, losses are limited uh, to 100% of the margin, but not more. And uh, therefore we have to add here an additional coding line. So let's again use here a leverage of seven. And uh, then we calculate the levered returns by multiplying seven with all simple returns, unlevered returns. And then we have to check the following with np.var. So if uh, the levered return is uh, smaller than minus one, so smaller than uh, minus 100%, then we use uh, minus 100%. And uh, this allows us uh, to effectively limit uh, losses to 100%. So let's do this here. And uh, let's again visualize. So now the graph uh, shouldn't slip below zero. So it's just uh, ending at uh, zero. So we lose uh, the complete margin here. And again, we can double check this here. So we end up at uh, minus 100%. And uh, coming back now to our hypothesis. So it's untrue that the more leverage, uh, the better. So even for highly profitable investments or instruments, uh, this does not hold. And uh, we could also say that uh, leverage amplifies losses more than it amplifies gains. So margin trading and uh, leverage always requires uh, risk monitoring and uh, risk management tools like uh, stop loss. So that's a simple one, but uh, that's uh, beyond the scope of uh, this lecture and uh, this section here. And as a final remark, you would come to a different conclusion if you would multiply log returns uh, with leverage. So probably you wouldn't have all these uh, conclusions here with log returns. So try this out and uh, see what happens uh, with log returns. But uh, keep in mind uh, that working with log returns is uh, simply incorrect here. So with leverage, uh, we have to work with simple returns. And uh, that's uh, the key message here of uh, this lecture. Thanks for watching and uh, see you in the next one. Bye.